welcome back then, champions of the realm, to this Paladin Summer Premiere at DreamHack Valencia. My name, once again, is Hyrez Vox. You just saw me on stage, Hyrez Confused. I'm joined by Alan Eyehall Penn, Donna Frio. Not alone this time, hey! I do have one of my own. I have hey! a Hyrez Penn with me here today no, as well. So I just, I've got a stock one. I just got the official branding, man. E everything is official. Where's the Hyrez logo on my suit? I feel you like get a tailor. Somewhere. Really? Yeah. Oh, damn. You should have told me about that before. But no, we've got plenty of Hot Panels action coming up next. We do have, of course, after just seeing Gangstars take down Ferris in the quarterfinals, the next set, which is going to be Denial versus Cryptic. Now, this is a heat up, heated matchup. Shift, you're the American here. As a European, I feel like you've got to take point on this. What are we in for? The thing about it, there is a lot of anticipation for what both of these squads can bring, not only at a major LAN event, but specifically over the last handful of weeks in the qualifier. Early on, if you remember back to just after the Masters, Denial was actually finding a lot of success against this Cryptic team. Not the case in high res sponsored tournaments. Cryptic has been nearly untouchable. And this is the real big proving grounds. A lot of people wanted to see another Denial Kanga, but this is, I think, spicier just to see who, in fact, could be the best team in North America. Right, and this is a matchup which we've seen plenty of times before during the North American qualifiers. And it's that little bit of a, how do we just say this, a saving grace for the team of Denial is able to maybe come back in, maybe overthrow Cryptic here, but we do have our bracket available. Let's go ahead and pull it up on screen and see exactly what is going on here. Yeah, we already saw match one be played in our first semifinalist establishes Gangstar. This will establish who plays up against them tomorrow in that best of seven match. But of course, later today, we're going to see the other counterpart to that EU side with District 69. And the relatively unknown Team QG Craze from China. We saw them, of course, last at HRX, and that was a team that adapted and learned very quickly. It's interesting to see how much they've progressed over the last six months. And I feel like that's a, that's a term which we can really put towards every single team that's here on stage. I mean, we've got the eight regions, or the eight teams from all the different regions around the world here. All of them, they have to be as adaptable as possible. They have to be able to adjust on the fly to just the different meta picks and the flavor picks which come out from all around the region. I mean, we just saw quite a bit of a Nara played by Ferris, and whilst it didn't seem to phase Gangstars too much, on Ice Mines, they did get held. And as a result, we may see, maybe in the Cryptic Denial games, a little bit more of the same. As we get into these more less known regions, should we right. say, that re receive just less airtime, maybe the European and North American teams are less familiar with them. I'm really excited to see what might come out. I've heard rumors of Ying Grog. That sounds scary. Well, that would be very different. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Without a doubt. And speaking of familiarity, I mean, these teams know each other so well. I mean, they've played up against each other with relatively the same squads over the course of this entire year, kind of culminating so far at this point here across the pond in Europe. It's going to be interesting, though, because Cryptic is one of those squads that we've talked about so often with these high-level teams when you talk about Gangstars, D69 and Cryptic. They're able to play any champion on any player. Denial has not shown that as of yet, and coming into this, I can feel like they're more of the one-dimensional team here playing a lot of ruckus and finding themselves kind of rooted into particular people playing particular picks. It'll be interesting to see what Z1, obviously, is kind of the wild card when very much so. the squad. Now, it's not to say that these picks don't work out very well for them. Right. Uh, Denial, when they do play their flavor picks, they play them phenomenally, but there is that sort of restriction which could be dangerous for them if they are pigeonholed into specific picks and then aren't either able to get those or counter picks have been discovered for them. I mean, we always talk about the Androxuses on yeah. this team, specifically with players like Stolzi or Prince Danny, who unfortunately isn't able to make it here, and Z1 is subbing in his place. And as a result, maybe just having that different person around is going to sh uh, shift around the champion pool very slightly. I mean, what are your thoughts as to Z1 joining them for this, uh, this event? It's almost like a rejoin, though, right? It I mean, is. He's played on Eager before, and he's had that familiarity with a lot of his players. I mean, Bitey, Arai are two of the big rooted ones when it comes down to what this squad has looked like. And so you throw in a Stolzi after having the HRX, that frag ability, and Z1 coming back in after, again, I'm sure a lot of you have seen him play. He's not exactly what I would call the worst player in the world. You know, I'm getting uh, I'm getting thrown a little bit back to, you know, the double hexakill. But, oh my gosh. you know, let's talk about Team Cryptic for the time being, because they are the number one team coming out of North America. They've been absolutely devastating so far through the online qualifier phase, and they've got a lot of big names on their squad as well. A lot, and they've established themselves as being the dominant team in North America over the course of specifically since qualifying for Masters all the way through. You see Dosef's on screen. Again, that calm, collected guy that you hear on stream brings a lot of extra spice and flavor once he gets behind the wheel. And of course, one of the more vocal players in Paladins, Cus Cutie, give him the peace sign. We'll see how long that peace lasts between both these teams. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And sitting here in the middle, right, it's going to be Evil Eye. Not the Ivuli, which we once knew, but oh. the uh, Bomb King Wizard from North America. And then coming in again, shift. I drop bodies. 
I mean, that's, his name lives up to his reputation, and of course, the... <laughs> I mean, how can we forget? How, how can we not talk about Wardoom, right? Just coming in from uh, a, a year and a little bit onwards yeah. from the very first big DreamHack event at DreamHack Summer. I mean, it's Wardoom, but then across the side, we do have the Nile Esports all getting ready here. Right on the Coach. end, it's Coach Barty himself sitting a little bit neater up than usual. He's had a, actually had a haircut in a bit yeah, before so he, he arrived. Yeah, really well groomed comparatively for an Idaho boy. Oh, there, oh, there we <laughs> there go. There's the dog. Stolzy, the man himself. Getting loose, and he's, he's put a really interesting change, playing a lot of hits again, now going over to getting more of that. Blaster base damage, Wi-Fi, Wiffle, W1 fluid outs, whatever you want to call them. This uh, this patch is playing the most of the Makoa. Makoa main, yeah, absolutely. And of course, just proceeding through the rest of the team, we're sitting on right towards the end is Arai and Z1 unknown at the end there as well. And Z1 ready for the action. Excited to see what he's going to bring to the table. And so far, we do have our maps available. But looks at things on your screen. It's going to be interesting to see where they decide to go. These teams have had very similar map pools as far as what they prefer. But the thing about it is Cryptic has found the Kryptonite. When it comes to Denial, they've found really no real pressure to get off of any particular map simply because they've held the edge in this matchup versus Denial for so long. Yeah, no, absolutely. And with map pools being available now, we've seen quite a few different ones between these teams' favorites specifically. We always tend to go back to the Temple Isle set when yeah. teams tend to feel a bit out of their depth or they want to go with something familiar. But notably, a bit of Bright Marsh players come out between these two teams more recently, and that brings a whole new dynamic between them. You talk about the Ruckus, which Denial lean on quite heavily, often played by Body, and Aerial Assault grinding you a, a great deal of mobility on that map to get up and down the higher ledges on the point and the repulsive field being valuable around the objective. But it's also one where we've seen Wardoom, for example, pull out Inara specifically as well. An impasse on a map like Bright Mars can be very yeah. devastating. It's like you're reading my mind. I was about to say almost the exact same thing. That impasse I'm is... I'm just taking all the knowledge. <laughs> all all the, the knowledge. knowledge. I mean, everything is so fluid, but at the same time, it is, everything is very congested in that map. Very I mean, it's, much it's a so. long S path that gets from the spawn point to the capture point, obviously to then the, the conversion point later on. So a pick like Anara could be very big if we do see Bright Marsh coming out. And I expect to. I mean, these teams in North America have played a lot more than the EU counterparts in the top one and two qualifiers between Gangstars and T69. And I feel like actually with this North American matchup, we're probably going to end up seeing less of that Temple Isle set and more of the, uh, maybe the flavor pick maps around the peripheral of the realm. It'd be nice to get a map actually of the realm and see where all these do take place. <laughs> of course, we know that Temple Isle, it's all a big map theme, but we've seen some Stone Keep come out as well. Again, Aerial Assault Rock is playing a great deal into that map. Also very good for Androxus as well. So maybe leaning a bit more towards Denial, but then again, the champion pools which Cryptic have demonstrated have not been short on either counterplay or actually just more advantageous picks on maps like these. Very much so. And these teams also, and this is another map that we haven't seen a lot of in competitive play, but Fish Market is one that we've seen mm. come up very often in North America as of lately. Uh, but it'll be interesting to see if there is any curveballs thrown, whether it's going to be possibly a Timber Mill or an Ice Mines, like we saw Furious try to pull out on Gank Stars. It might just take that little bit of un familiarity for Cryptic to go down to Denial. It has to be something a little bit unusual, right? And we always talk about the map draft with the familiar maps, the comfort picks. Everyone feels at home. And this is an international LAN event. Maybe you don't want your enemies to feel at home. You want them to feel out of place. And if one of these teams has been regularly scrimming a map like Timber Mill or a map like Ice Mines, which we did actually see in the first set of today, relatively unusual, then that could throw a bit of a spanner in the works for some of these teams. Oh, that could be enough. a little bit different to deal with. The maps are on screen, though. The first map up is going to be Bright Mars Shift. I feel like we're on the same wavelength. The players, the players, they're all in the same wavelength here. Yeah, without a doubt. And again, this is a map that they've really kind of split back and forth between their Very ESL awesome. matches and, of course, their higher as official events. So this is probably the best way to establish what this best of five is going to look at and what's going to look like as we potentially get to map three, possibly four, possibly five. We'll see. Be very exciting to see if it does come about. Of course, folks, this is a best of five set in the quarterfinals. Minimum of three wins in a row for one team to take the edge of the other and advance through to the semifinals. And as we mentioned, they'll be facing Gangstars tomorrow on the upper side of this single elimination bracket, which is definitely a tough cookie to crack, but starting off strong in day one, certainly the way to lead it. Bright Marsh being the first map then. What kind of champion picks are you expecting on this map primarily? Let's talk draft for the time being. I, I think that you hit the two big ones on the head with Ruckus and Anara having a lot of impact on this map. But you also got to keep in mind what that capture point looks up. It's in that giant atrium. It's very congested with a couple windows here and there. We've seen Willow come out a couple of different times from both of these squads. And the other one that you always have to kind of keep your eye on when you're playing up against Cryptic is Cuss Cutie playing.
playing that healing pip. He has done it very successfully before and at land before. That's the big flavor pick that I think we'll see how well can Denial really respond to if it does end up coming out. I know the pip pickup on Bright Marsh has actually been a, uh, a favorite of potentially not the PC teams, but we've seen a lot of it in the console wars qualifiers recently as well. Actually able to traverse the map very well, healing potions being useful, as you mentioned on the point stack, but also just the efficacy of evil mojo is something which a lot of players aren't very used to fighting into right now. And that surprise factor could come in big, I'm wondering potentially though, if we have a map with a lot of choke points like this, where players have got to walk directly through doorways to get towards the objective, the value of t maybe Tyra and her firebomb could certainly not be undervalued here. Coach has been saying for a long time how oh, yeah. much he thinks Tyra is undervalued in the PC scene. First blood Tyra. Yeah, and he's said a lot about what that value brings to a champion that, again, its biggest crux is the fact that it does not have a lot of mobility built into it, Very but true. it can have that self-sustain where you can really just be that damage dealer in the midline and pick apart not only damage dealers that expose themselves, but also having a lot of impact, you mentioned with the firebomb on frontliners. That's really, really big to take down what is that all important frontline. We see so often right now in Paladins, it comes down to sometimes both frontliners and one support. Those three can keep themselves in the fight for such a long time. And that's your core, right? If you're able to deal with that, firebomb doing that in a uh, dual pronged approach with percentage based damage based off a champion's maximum health, as well as an inbuilt anti heal effect of 50% healing reduction. It's devastating very early on. In the game especially versus these frontliners now you mentioned the lack of mobility that a champion like tyra brings to the table or rather maybe doesn't bring is more appropriate here but then again if we talk draft order potentially then do you think that tyra is more of a, a later pickup for these teams because so often we're seeing frontline and support drafted early where does that leave your damage to come in I mean, we've seen a lot of these top tier teams out of North American EU kind of keep those. They want to establish those frontliners and those supports early on and then respond with their damage dealers. And especially when you're talking about it, a pick like Tyre that's not expected to go early, you could kind of hold that card in your hand until it absolutely has to come out and it could possibly give you that royal flush to what could be break apart Cryptic. Uh, but on the flip side, you also have picks like Pip that, again, are not a priority for teams like Denial. And that's where that familiarity, I think, comes into play them knowing each other so well, they can kind of tailor their draft around what they know their opponent is not going to pick. Not that, again, they need to worry about the fact that, well, we have to pick X, Y, and Z because we can't play A, B, and C. That's not the case for either of these teams. They can they can flex on just about any champion in the current pool. Including Grover. Cus yeah. actually has a bit of a reputation for Grover. We've seen that yeah. come out many times previously, maybe less so in high-level competitive play. Uh, and whilst we are on OB52 specifically for this event, we certainly know that that's a pick which is very much coming to the forefront of the competitive scene in the newer patches. PC, of course, now being looking at the OB54 in uh, PTS and the most recent release. Yeah, and I'm interested to see as well as not only, you know, the growth of the game, but these individual players specifically and how they've grown over the last handful of months. And I drop bodies, I think a lot of people did not think had the best performance in ever when it came to the Masters. Of course, still played really well, but he had a lot of weight on his shoulders coming in as far as being this all-star that's really going to really establish what is now Team Cryptic to be possibly a top three team in the world, still not finding it as of yet. And another player that really stood out to my mind from the Masters was, was Wi-Fi. He came out and played a tremendous Makoa oh, yes. compared to how he played at HRX. If that momentum could stay in Denial's favor, they have a really good shot here in this matchup against their North American rival. They certainly do, but momentum is going to be a bit of the name of the game here. And also maintaining that on a LAN stage and a LAN environment is an unfamiliar setting for these North American teams as well. Previously, they have played two LANs in North America. Now they're across the ocean. They're in Dreamhack Valencia in Spain. The temperature is rising, both in terms of, how should we say this, the pressure on these players to advance through the bracket, but also in the studio as well. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a bit of hot in the collar here just for us casters <laughs> getting ready for these games, but all the players are going to be waiting in the wings, just ready to go. And do you think that Nose might come into play for some of these players? They are more experienced now than they were, but some of them are still very new to the esports setting. I think that's really big when you consider initially when we were looking at what this denial squad had coming into their first line. None of them had much experience whatsoever. Now all of them have experience being in studio, seeing their opponents. You want to know, and of course, did not qualify with the team, but played with Rowan University oh, yes. way back in the AVGL. Oh, Shout out. Don't go Davenport, not in that case. 
very, very good set that we saw there at the Masters Land just to help start off that final day. And of course, uh, it's going to be really exciting. As you mentioned, they've got more experience now. The first step to succeeding at something is sucking at something. You've got to kind of get that initial experience. Yeah. And you really can't underestimate that land vibe. You're up on the stage, you're under these bright lights. There's a crowd that's cheering or maybe jeering in front of you, depending on who they're rooting for. And you've got a lot of pressure in your ears as well. That's enough to crack even the toughest of cookies. And a lot of these players, now they've developed maybe strategies for that, for handling it. We talk about esports and just gameplay mechanics and individual mechanical skill. Right. It's a mental game as well, very much for a lot of these players to keep their heads in the game. Uh, take, for example, if we look all the way back to DreamHack Summer and then HRX as well, we saw the team Gangstars, formerly Burrito Esports, formerly Torpedo Gaming, and we are able to uh, see how they maybe initially cracked under pressure and then have developed these strategies to be able to cope with the LAN environment, cope with all of the different just sources of energy and distraction and just excitement coming from all angles. And speaking of which, I'm very excited to be getting into these games, but we are encountering just a couple of technical difficulties. We'll be heading to a short break, but we'll be right back with this second set of the day. Cryptic versus Nile, the North American show match. Stay tuned. Welcome back then, champions, to this quarterfinals best of five set between Cryptic and Denial once again. Vox, I hold shift on the mics. We're ready to jump straight into the champion draft between these two teams for game number one, kicking things off on Bright Marsh. So let's not waste any time. Let's dive straight on into it. The draft is ready. The players are set shift. How are we going to kick things off today? I think it's got to sit with the front line first. Uh, Cryptic specifically has the ability of kind of flexing around a lot of different picks. Of course, we've seen Wardoom becoming one of the more premier front line players, even though he plays on this, this the most ridiculous mouse, sense. It's mass acceleration, isn't it? It's as well, ridiculous. It's, it's, how, do you, how are you doing that? I mean, <laughs> I know, whatever yeah, works yeah. for you, more power to you. And Cryptic here, do you have first pick? in this Bright Marsh showdown. So be interesting to see what comes away. I'm interested to see specifically if Cryptic might be looking to take something away from Denial, like a Ruckus pick, which is very much the comfort and safety zone for Denial. That'll go straight on through Denial. It's up to them to respond. And this is big because Bitey has only played two characters in the qualifiers. Ruckus is one, Anara is the second. So do they go with Anara early on? That being said, of course, Wi-Fi has also been able to play both Makoa Barrick and Anara with that. Mako will be taken. Do they go for the double front line early on? It will actually be Androxus establishing their fragger really early on. That's actually something which we have seen a little bit of as well, going through some of the qualifying phases. Makoa also very valuable to draft alongside Androxus. Dredjanka does, of course, pass through reversal, can be a primary counter pick there. But as we see available on your screen now, Cryptic respond by stripping away the Inara, getting that double frontline established, ensuring that you can't get the Makoa Inara on next to each other and grabbing Drogos as well. So taking away a big form of area denial, but drafting Drogos straight into Androxus. This is a very bold play. A very bold play, but again, these are the top two picks that we've seen Bitey play. What is he going to go to? Will we possibly see them going with that Tyra? He's been able to pick it up previously. It will be a Bomb King and Ceres picked up, and that's a good pick. Arai has been very good on Ceres, staying alive, and of course getting massive healing numbers along with that for his team. The Bomb King does bring a lot of displacement with that potential of throwing a Grumpy Bomb on point, scattering everybody around. But on Very top of so. that, those are two big targets with Ruckus and Inara for him to target down with those Sticky Bomb auto attacks. And that's going to be very important also just to get some higher health pools on the side of Denial as well. Androxus, very squishy and only 2k. Bomb King and Ceres, a bit more survivable, but Cryptic answering back in stride. Cassie hovered over, not locked in just yet. A bit more of an unusual pick, but coming back in as of late. One final pick left to go as well for Team Cryptic. They are missing their support. It's got to be the Null It's not going to be anything besides them. I'm wondering if this Cassie pick might be traded, but it looks like it's pretty confident with it so far. I'm excited to see the Team Cryptic Maldumba come out of play as well. Yeah, this is a really solid lineup for Cryptic. Just from the front to the back, it just looks really good. Of course, no damage fall off for Cassie at distance, so she can sit back and poke away at anybody who happens to put themselves on point. On top of that, you throw in Maldumba, who's got a huge ultimate, that Dread Serpent. You see everyone kind of running around with that giant fear keeping everyone away from point, and it's, oh, it's going to be an Ash. Interesting pickup for okay. Denial. Now, I do like this. Denial are getting double frontline online to match double frontline. Ash, very survivable, has a lot of sustainability through the, maybe the, uh, the, the fact that you can reduce your damage with Shoulder Bash with some of her legendaries, as well as also her ultimate assert dominance, providing her with full damage immunity 
for eight seconds when you do activate that can be useful at buying time for your team to respawn and regroup in sort of clutch situations. And I'm expecting that we might see some of that come into play on this objective fight. Also, bearing in mind, CC immunity can be granted by her Battering Ram Legendary. True. That could be very, very key when dealing with a Maldamba. This is the interesting though, the Dial has yet to play Ash on a major stream. This will be really interesting to see not only, I imagine Bitey will have to be playing her, I don't want to speculate too far, but just how the coordination is going to go. I mean, that's a, I mean, we've seen Ash kind of come out of the ashes, quite literally, uh, over the last couple of weeks. We'll have to see how as we get into game this is realized for the side of Denial. Exactly. Who's playing who? But of course, Team Cryptic, they are the blue squad for you this time around. Denial, the red team, the underdogs, two, maybe based off their seeding. The and of course, we get begun. towards the objective initial itemization. That'll come in just a second, but it'll be crucial to see how the position of these teams breaks down. I like the early mending spirits on the warding. He's from the live was He pushed out very early, but Grumpy Bomb from the high ground straight to the back line of Team Cryptic. That could be dangerous, and Cus Cutie gets stunned. Yeah, but it's not going to lead to much. His first blood comes the way of Evil Eye. Team Cryptic getting on early. Pulled into danger, though, is Drogos, but able to thrust away with just a little over 200 HP, and now turning his focus on the Bomb King, but will be boxed out. Stolzy getting himself on the board, but still 30% Favorite team also didn't receive any support from Aldamba during that time. Maybe Custody expected them to dip out of combat just for a little while and heal up, but instead pushes forwards aggressively, and that might be a thorn on the side of Team Cryptic if they do try and take fights, which they just can't afford to. Buddy on Ash, for denial as predicted shift, looking to hold down the front line, can't save them Makoa, but is just buying time for their team and Ooh. <laughs> Okay! Well, going swimming I see. We took a trip to the beach yesterday and buddy. Very much keen to get out there as well, but too far away from Serpent Beach. Still, Denial holding down the objective for time being shift, 72% on Rising. Really good flank control, mostly coming out of Stolzi, although he does just fall there. He was doing a really good job from on top of that awning, right around that area right there. You see Whitey is just underneath at the moment, did a lot of damage, but still Cryptic finding their focus, getting back together, and getting themselves above 90%, and now Ash has to get in. Block. Good body block indeed, as 96% in counting up. It will be Team Cryptic finding the first point in the scoreboard. And I love that position from the front line of the Team Cryptic, just forcing themselves out, saying we don't have a shield. We don't have Inara's impasse available to block off that avenue of entry. So we'll just stand there. Yeah. There are two big bodies on the objective. 4,400 plus health for Ruckus, if not counting the emitter. And Inara just sits there so tanky. That's going to block off the entire avenue of entry. And that will allow Team Cryptic, as you said, first cap. Wow. Now with two minutes left, pushing very, very quickly further and oh. forwards. Big Hex of Fire putting right into the face of Ash. But a Sir Dominance comes out, so counters it out completely. And I drop Body is forced to use the advance again in that retreat fashion. Does not quite get out as Z1 unknown on the Androxus. Finds himself a frag and getting on board with him. See if he can find the Maldama. Would be a big pick. Able to gourd himself back up. And Z1 not able to convert the kill as of yet. You can see the cauterize is available for Z1 unknown here. Just a rank one, so only 30% healing reduction applied on his weapon shots. Useful at taking out this Maldama, but until that comes out of play later in the game, that's not going to be quite as effective. And Z1 might just go down to the Maldama as Dread Serpent came out. No, force the dose ups on Cassie, but the ultimate has been expanded by Team Cryptic. Trying to push this one through. They are pushing very far forwards now. Evil Eye as well. Well, straight to the back line of their enemies. Ash gets shut down on the forefront, and now Denial, they have one last chance with respawns to make this uh, hold count. Yeah, and when Dosups is getting onto his Cassie again, he's one of those big Grandmaster Cassies. He's played a lot of them throughout with just a little over a minute, so over time, the push is successful. And again, I drop bodies holding on that front line, but what I was getting at was the fact that Cassie, when you have that front line kind of scattered from Denial, she's able to roll and just get all the way around both of them and kind of trigger back and forth and be that big distraction that you would typically associate with an Androxus or an Eevee. Cassie with a 7 streak showing up. Matches the mobility. Itemization now on your screens for both teams. Talk me through Team Cryptic. They're ahead in credits here, and they started to pull ahead in itemizations of itemization as well. Without a doubt, it is an extra 300 credits when you get that initial capture point. But of course, those kill streaks. Every time you get those kills, also boosting that up. And you can see what a big steep plateau that net worth chart is. Five, All five players four, almost even for three, Team Cryptic, and just two. below, staggering in linear fashion is denial. And again, with that Chronos, again we're getting that cooldown reduction, building and building, you're going to start to see all these abilities for the side of Team Cryptic coming out more often. With champions like Inara and Ruckus with very impactful abilities such as Impass and Repulsive Field on their side, 
Chronos, very, very important. Initial team fight breaking out, straight to the back line is Z1 unknown. Looking for a pick or a frag, but is trying to box out with those ups on Cassie here. No finds Cascudi, who's shut down by Stolzy. That'll open things up for Denial, and they do have the comeback mechanic active. 27% uh, now, 35, and rising for Denial on the objective. Z1 still hunting in the back line, and even though they're not fighting frags, they're finding distraction, and that's paying off in a big way oh. for Denial. <laughs> the impass wall blocking the way for the teammate as Dosups does fall. But the big stat against the Nile found themselves a lot of early capture. Evil Eye found himself an opening though here on the right side, perspectively for them finding a double kill through before he fell. And now I drop bodies taking the baton and pushing right into the face of the Ash. A certain dominance will come out just to try to get them the wall. But the impasse again will actually wall off the rest of the Nile. And Stolz is in a really bad spot, will fall from Dosups. It's going up the way though, 97% for Denial. One more tick of capture for him. And really important here as Dredson comes out. No shutdown. Wi Fi it was sitting on their ancient raid there as Makoa. Huge conversions, pulls in everybody. But I drop bodies, picks up three on Ruckus. Z1 unknown trying to contest around the outside. Is able to find a frag of their own, but now taken out by Cus Cutie. Stolzy once again. Extended without their teammates. Might be in a very bad position here. The King Bomb is found. It goes straight into Ruckus. They're just too tanky. 87% are rising for Team Cryptic. Denial must make it back to the objective. It'll be Wi-Fi in Ancient Rage. And he needs to hold on for as long as possible. Saris is getting a lot of damage put right on top of her in the back line. Wi-Fi does fall, though. Unfortunately, over time, that bar's ticking away. Z1 does get a kill. Stolzy will commit to it, and Denial. they will simply throw him away. The poppy bomb was enough to just barely throw off the edge, and Denial get themselves a much-needed capture point, as you can see. All the kills filing through for Cryptic right afterwards. That was beautiful coming through. You know, we've seen an example of that in top five plays as well, where as long as there aren't, if there isn't a member of both teams on the objective, overtime will not be triggered. You can get these last minute incredible captures like that and using displacement abilities such as Poppy Bomb, which is primarily used by most Bomb Kings as a movement ability rather than to throw enemies away in a different fashion to normal. Well, Denial are able to answer back. Two to one the scoreboard, six minutes and 50 seconds into this just game one. And Denial are trying to gain some ground here. Pull and I drop bodies, this could be big. Yeah, but again, this aerial assault is just getting him up and over these corners so quickly. You can see he's on a massive streak. Oh, although now he does just fall. So that all that percentage given the way of Mighty for his ultimate set, 94% for that assert dominance, but does drop those ups again, being such a distracting force, not only from the back line, but that instance is picking apart from the long range side of things, a good pull once again. Wi-Fi hitting a lot of these clutch dredge anchors, pulling them into danger. Ooh, and nice reversal here as well, but again, there's too many blue bodies as Cryptic continues to establish themselves as being the victors in the majority of these team fights. For the time being, and again, just caught out, Buddy will likely fall here. A lot of headshots coming through for eye drop bodies, and eventually just will go down. Sent back to base, no battering of Ash is able to just keep on buying time for that team, but at this point, it feels like Buddy's holding themselves back by not respawning, but no, Saris comes back in, drops the restore soul, down goes a certain dominance. Was that a Convergence as well. We hear pulling into, looking for the wow. dredge anchor play. Arai picks up Cus QT, and that'll open the path for payload conversion as the all important support is now missing from Team Cryptic. It's very important, especially to the team composition that Cryptic has. Ruckus, of course, has a little bit of self sustained built in him, but Anara is the issue. You need to have some kind of a pocket heal to keep her alive. And you can see now just resorting on the impasse to keep damage away from her and her team. And Cryptic has completely fallen back into their spawn, allowing Denial to move this a little bit for free. And a nice pull once again as Evil Eye falls. Big damage to her off the board. Stolzy channeling the King Bomb, looking for that explosion. Will completely miss his head to fire. His channel right outside the doorway. And Eye Drop Bodies again finding clutch pickups. That time with the Hex Fire. Really nice angle for Stolzy to cancel the King Bomb early. Just exploded to not be hit by the Hex of Fire. But the follow up damage from Cassie, too much to deal with. Ash left around. The objective is contesting. Overtime has started for Denial. But with no really remaining members, only Androxus and Ash sitting there trying to contest. Overtime is ticking down, but Wi-Fi returns on Makoa. Can they hold under their half shell? The damage from Evil Eye is too much. That shield, it breaks down very quickly. Returning, Grumpy Bomb sets up a big start on the cusp, you see, but again, Team Cryptic, they just have the respawn proximity advantage. They defend successfully and go up three to one, match point for map number one at nine minutes in. It's pretty uh, staggering defeat there for now. And Fox, tell me a little bit of something. Wi-Fi has his ultimate. Did not choose to use the Ancient Rage in that instance. Is there any particular reason why you might 
wonder why that happened. Now, I really do like this. We often see a lot of high-level competitive teams holding ultimates on the payload push. Yes, Denial had the opportunity to equalize, and we seconds. did just see Team Cryptic use a lot of their own ultimates, but these ultimates, they're sort of like bargaining chips, right? It's okay, we need one to be able to hold down the objective, we need one to be able to counter this person, this person. Wi-Fi holding it onto Agent Rage just provides three, Denial with maybe two, more of a guarantee that they can get this next objective capture, and importantly, coming through, they do still have the comeback mechanic active. It's more safe for Denial to go for a capture objective than it is to try and secure a single payload push and then fight on neutral ground with Team Cryptic, who took the first objective on neutral footing. Yeah, Wi-Fi getting stunned out there. No chance to proc the Agent Rage. Looked like he was about to channel it up. But still, Denial does have that comeback mechanic in effect up to above 46%. And they found the picks right around the point. Even though they lost the flank, they won the point. It's one of those lose the battle, potentially win the war situations in that aspect. And that's exactly what we're seeing. And the zone is actually going really well. Z1 and Known is starting to come more to life. He had a really kind of a rough early game, not hitting a lot of shots. He's found that opportunity, though, to jump in. And Denial for essentially free this time through has very little to contest with as they get themselves two straight points. Not only down, just the one point of margin. And whilst Team Cryptic with the respawns fresh out of base, do have a couple of picks. Stolzy on Bomb King is really making things happen for the team. It's not just C1 who seems to come alive. 1v3 in the back line distracting. Stolzy also is finding frags which they need to on Bomb King. Maybe finding their rhythm, finding the groove that they have to with the bombs being lobbed out now towards the enemy back line. That's going to be so crucial. Trying to break up Cryptic's all important front line. There's a sustain coming through for this is insane. Yeah, Drop Bodies does get taken out. He's really close. This is a much more successful area for King Bob. What will he find, though? Exploded early, and no one converted. A missed opportunity again for Stolzi. A cursed arm in the air, looking for damage from Z1. Not able to find much from him either. So the couple ultimates suspended for not much. It's the frontliners that are getting the kills, though, as Bitey jumps right in. We'll put a lot of devastating bruise right into Ruckus and Bolt over here on the perspective right side for them. But I drop Bodies, and the aerial assault again. So Maneuverable, gets himself out, gets healed up, and jumps right back in. He's the one holding down the front line here, but still a minute 20. This payload is coming around this corner really quick. And just consistently bombarded by Ash as well. They try and line up some shots through some of the doorways. Mighty gonna retreat here, shoulder back, and he safe as Battering Ram does reduce the damage they take whilst in that ability by 90%. What a legendary play with a legendary equipped. Evil Eye boxing out against Z1 Unknown is taking down the back line. That could be dangerous though, but Cus Beauty is able to hold things down for the team. No, might be in a lot of trouble here now as Z1 Unknown keeps on fragging in the back line. Bidey returns in the spawn, gonna try and displace Ruckus away from the payload so it can continue advancing. It is contested with 45 seconds left to go, but this is looking much better from Denial this time around. Double kill for Z1 Unknown. Opening this up, looks for triple kill. That will be the seismic crash activated by Inara, but Stolzi cleans up the Stone Warden, and there is nobody left who can contest. Wow, I was about to say the convergence was still able to be utilized if necessary, but they didn't even have to use it. So now we're all tied up, convergence on the board, King Bomb not too far away, and you can see again the comeback that's been coming out of Denial. They've not only matched what that net worth was very early on, but now they have surpassed it again. Now a total of 600 credits going their way from just capturing the point, and we're in that late game itemization. You see a lot of those hourglasses, again, representing the Chronos, getting the level two Points for a number of players, and on top seconds. of that, the Cauterize as well, almost every instance, actually now, in fact, every instance, at level three. It's 90% mitigation from any healing coming in to any targets that are applied Five. with that. Debuff, so that's really, really Three, big late in this game. It does. It really changes one. the playstyle dynamic, and that's where I feel a little bit like Denial have an edge here, because they have a shield they can hide behind and make sure they're not affected by cauterize when they get healed up. But straight to the top is Stolzy. Convergence thrown out. Z1 unknown. Looking for the flank again. Can't find those ups on Cassie that has the target in their sights for the time being. No evil eye goes in. Takes out Body with Dragon Punch. Gets shut down in response, though. And on the objective, Team Cryptic 12%. Denial only three. Fighting very much around the peripheral of this fight. Not wanting to step foot onto the objective just yet because it is a death trap if they do so. Not a doubt. There was no support up for Cryptic up until that respawn just came out and Denial took their time getting back in but a kick off way back in the back line. Can it find anyone to convert on? It hits three but again not able to find any follow up with the damage. Where is it? Well really importantly there nothing from Stolzi as Cus Cutie was able to immune that stun and damage with Slave of Throat. The Snake Toss and actually get a stun onto the bomb key and now back towards the objective. Inara was contesting but Ancient uh -oh. Rage comes through from Wi-Fi. Cus Beauty trying to run, gets onto the gourd, but too little, too late. Still goes down, keeps the frontliners alive, but cauterized three pressure from Z1 on Owens and Droxus is too much to deal with. There, Doze Ups comes in as Cassie gets the shutdown with dodge wow. roll, but Denial are unmoving from the objective. They take victory in game number one. The North American underdog team coming through.
Looking good. Looking fluffy. <laughs> Coach is all excited about that one. And that is such a strange map and matchup for me. The damage dealers really didn't bring the big brood of the force. It was a lot of the frontliners controlling and contesting the point. You see I drop bodies at 70,000 damage. 82,000 for Wardum on Inara. Top damage overall does go the way of Evil Eye at 109,000, but again, it's just that he died 14 times. You die that much, that damage is there only part of the time. It allows the opportunity for 142,000 healing from Orion. I mean, these numbers are massive. It again comes down to the fact that the objective time favored the side of denial at the end. 190 total for Ceres. I really do have to ask you that. The, the whole Drogo's into an Androxus of Z1 Unknown's caliber. One of the first players to be able to utilize uh, Androxus like that way back in the WAN. Dangerous. But on screen right now, as we just saw, Stolzy, Bomb King player from the previous game, looking good on a different champion to usual. It's interesting. He didn't look fantastic, but he looked good enough. He picked that up aspect. steam as well as the yeah. game went through. Without a doubt. I mean, there are a couple of early King Bombs that were really not effective whatsoever. Again, you can't take it away just from him. It was the fact that Eyedrop Bodies triggered a lot of really good Hexafires just to keep him away from getting to that back line. He started to find some flavor with the Accelerant Poppy Bomb later on to get towards the back line, but still, the focus from Cryptic to get onto that massive ultimate has been really good. And that's a big takeaway for Cryptic, even though they didn't take the map. They were able to keep a lot of the damage away. They need to find a way to keep their damage alive, though. Again, the 14 deaths for Evil Eye is really the big crutch in that aspect of why they didn't get themselves up on top at the end. It would be very interesting to see exactly how that does break down as well. Those deaths, is it primarily coming from maybe diving in too deep? Of course, we right. could see Evil Eye going in very deep towards the enemy backline, maybe displacing themselves slightly too far, trying to confirm direct hit damage onto a lot of enemies. Or is it more Z1 or Non on Androxus hunting them down specifically? There's a lot that could be said for this team to maybe improve on their own positioning, but also reactive counterplay towards the pressure yeah. which Denial are able to output towards them. I think if we want to see Cryptic take back a game in this set at all, we're going to have to see an adjustment as to how they play and how they're positioning. Frontline and support positioning, phenomenal throughout the duration of that game from Cryptic. Damage, well, there's something which could be maybe a little bit more favorable. Without a doubt, and you've got to give props to Denial on that first map of Bright March. They've done very well throughout the history of this last couple of months of getting that victory on Bright March. They're going to have to do the same thing, though, on Stone Keep. I mean, most notably, looking back, it is a 5-4 set swap between these two, favoring Team Cryptic. But before this, it was 0-5 in total history in favor of the Cryptic roster. So again, Denial has a lot of adversity coming up into this matchup, but they have been able to do so, especially in more recent history. Stone Keep, though, will be an interesting one, specifically because we see a lot of that tall foliage that comes into play around the point, those big trees. And of course, you have that whole viney area around that little turn and the keep and the church have very close quarters. It brings a lot of dynamic, but the other big thing about this map, Fox, is how short it is vertically between spawn, capture point, and the opposite spawn. There's not a lot of distance there. On the respawns, especially with maybe one instance of master riding, if necessary, as we did see Kronos for the cooldown reduction prioritized very heavily, you do see the frontliners specifically returning to the fight very, very frequently. But then again, this is a map that also brings a great deal of just open space and verticality throughout the large point catcher area. And it's controlling the high ground that is so, so important for many teams on this map. For example, we did actually see within at least the European ESL tournaments, the very first time creatives ran Willow on this map. Super effective because you have a very direct path to be able to dead zone the objective, drop yeah. big AOE damage from above. And as long as nobody is contesting you, you're just firing shot after shot after shot. And somebody has to go up there to shut you down, which then distracts from the objective fight. Yeah, it, the distraction element, I think, is really important, specifically on this map. Usually it comes down to pulling more massive flanks of three or more people through either the church or the keep side to get to a back line. But in particular, I think that this map, more than just about any other, does rely on those damage dealers getting secured and confirmed damage onto the front line. Very often though, with a lot of these maps, it's front line versus front line, that battle in the trenches. Oh yeah. This one has a lot more space in those line of sights from deep over the course of the map to get the damage dealers to funnel some damage onto that front line. So I think this map in particular is not just up to that damage dealer doing it, but specifically which of these two primary support players are gonna be able to bring 
that extra sustain that their team needs to stay through the fights. And it's going to be very valuable, of course, with the open nature of the capture objective. You talk about frontline versus frontline them being bombarded by damage, which maybe they're not used to. Champions like Inara, with no movement ability, with limited vertical protection, who has an impasse they can hide behind, which can be bypassed just by going straight over the top. Less effective on a map like Stonekeep than maybe some other champions. It's one where we maybe see Barrett coming out due to the fact they can hide their turrets behind trees. It's one where we might be seeing, we've seen the, uh, the Makoa so far. We might be probably going to see the Ruckers. I think with Aerial Assault on a map like Stonekeep, yeah. it's a given. But I'm wondering, maybe even a Fernando or a Torval necessary if you're into a heavy shield-based composition. Yeah, we haven't seen Fernando yet today. And uh, neither of these North American teams play a lot of Fernando in the game's current state. I mean, of course, Wardoom has had that presence before. Wardoom plays hide and seek Fernando, though. Oh, He's it's very really distinctive in the it's way he does it. It's very, very <laughs> different to how a lot of players do play Fernando, basing more around movement speed and just poke and poke and poke and be a distraction, be annoying. And that's a some of the value which Fernando can bring to a team fight rather than being a presence on the objective. Just ne needling away at the backline enough to make them worry. Because, of course, if Fernando does get up in your face, it's a very big health pool. It's difficult to run away from, but we'll have to see exactly how the draft is broken down as we are now ready. Denial, first pick this time around. Last time Ruckus was stripped away, didn't turn out to be necessary to their success, but is it crucial here? I certainly think so. Without a doubt, and uh, of course, again, we've seen Bitey so famously on the aerial assault Ruckus has done an incredible job of establishing that legendary as being a very viable option for the character, and not just viable, but super impacting to where it can be a total game changer. This time through, though, it will be the first overall pick. And to respond, Cryptic is going to go with a very early Bomb King. Again, knowing what that counterplay is involved with just the kit that Bomb King brings against a Ruckus. And on top of that, Makoa taken early on. You know, I really do like the Bomb King pick early here, specifically for Cryptic. We often see one blast to go to each team in terms of when we talk about uh, blasters, big AoE damage, such as the Drogos or the Bomb King. Taking a Bomb King, I feel like it's more versatile on Stonekeep. You have the ability to transition through the map very, very easily with an Accelerant Poppy Bomb. Drogos, on the other hand, can be caught out of uh, and in danger in midair, especially if there's maybe a Knesso on the enemy team, or even a Shaolin who can land a lot of planted on this map as well, yeah. following up on the Impaler Arrow. Those are two really uh, niche picks, and on this map in particular, they become extremely viable, especially against, you know, those shields that Makoa brings for Shaolin, and on top of that, just the safe distance that Kinesa has provided with the way the, the map is structured. So it will be Inara, Meldamba is the support picked up for Cryptic. No support yet for Denial. They held it until the last, again, showing that they don't really have a preference, whether it's going to be Ceres, Meldamba, potentially Ying, but we haven't seen a lot of her played by Denial. In recent history, it will be a Ceres picked up for the support and the option to go with the second front line. It will be Ash once more. And this is a very interesting pick on Stonekeep specifically. We just mentioned the fact that Inara can be dangerous on Stonekeep due to the fact that she hasn't got a great deal of range to her weapon. She's vulnerable if she's just standing on the objective, although with Mother's Grace in OB-52, less so due to the amount of sustain which she can gain. Ash is quite similar. This is before her range was buffed, and as a result, she is quite limited, but with Battering Ram and her Shoulder Bash, she's able to traverse the map very, very easily, and instead of uh, being vulnerable to a fight from range, she just brings the fight to the enemy team. That's going to allow Denial to potentially collapse onto their opponents. Look at both of the, the front lines we have here. High mobility is key to this team. They're going to be able to get up into the face of their enemies and force the fight where they want them. Team Cryptic are going to have to bend and not break in response, and there's no better champion to roll out out of the way of that incoming danger than Cassie. Oh, without a doubt. And it's just going to be really interesting, I think, to see how Ash has played with Ruckus, because you have to figure it's going to be bitey with Ruckus. And Wi-Fi has been, again, very one-dimensional. But as we take a look at this map, look how close the corridors are in all these inner areas. That's the keep portion we were talking about before. And the overhead, all of that tall foliage can really be an impact as far as getting King Bombs off successfully or not, as we've seen lately. As, as you can see on your screen, blue team then, of course, versus red team. Team names missing from the top of your screen. Shift, break it down. It's going to be a Denial on the blue, looking with that first pick to see what impact this Ruckus can bring to the table. Of course, Arai, the uh, dominating Five, support four, player for Denial, three, will be rocking the Ceres. And again, you see actually Morelbo is taken very early Let's on. Really like interesting it. pick just to get that convergence, that giant pull that you see with her ultimate up as much as possible. Can be very successful here and immediately to the high ground. They charge. No, actually biting on the low ground. It takes the elevator up to try and cut off their opponents, drive a wedge in between the front and the back line. Does so successfully briefly, but a is just sitting around the outside of the objective. Are they to get a lot of sustain onto their allies? Stolzy falls for first blood, but Z1 unknown answers back in tandem. Evil 
rely on the top side of the fight now, boxing out versus Androxus throws a big sticky bomb straight into reversal, and Z1 stays alive, is being chased down and hounded by Makoa now. Must retreat the back and full health very, very quickly thanks to Ceres. Still, objective pressure going straight on through to Team Cryptic. And this is the big factor, having Evil Eye on Bomb King. He's one of the more premier characters to play uh, that champion in specific, and he's done a good job so far finding two kills. Mighty able to oh. find one, though, on the Evil Eye. Cassie falling low. Stolz will pick it up. This is another opportunity for Denial to come around, get that high ground we were talking about being so important. Z1 will be picking apart at Cuskey, looking for that final shot, will convert it. Looking to turn around that reversal onto Inara, who still is not on the point. That's exactly where you want her, as far away from that point as possible, while Denial gets it to above 75% in their favor and looking for that first point on the scoreboard. There we go, 87, 90%, and rising. Dozops is going to try and close the gap, gets onto the objective to contest with the Grumpy Bomb there as well. It's going to force away the rest of Denial, but shut down by Wi-Fi in the back line. Good luck for the team in blue. Overtime is ticking. Evil Eye will close the gap. Again, Grumpy Bomb goes down, but this time there's a Seed Shield in the way. And honestly, with only one player contesting, you can soak that stun as long as you get the kill, because you're going to get the capture anyway. This is looking really good for Denial. This is looking much more complete even than the beginning of what was happening on Bright March. Wi-Fi has been playing aggressively, but not too aggressively. He's had his healer with him. Araya has been locked in to keep him alive. And on top of that, Stolze has been in the air just like this, looking at all these nice juicy targets below him, hitting a lot of salvos, a lot of Spitfires. As you see, two of those connect. Oh, big damage as well connecting through that last one. It's still just barely under two minutes, and this has looked really good for the side of blue. And of course, damage dealt actually led by Stolze in the charts here, and this is a big thing about their playstyle as well. By the movement speed that Stolze is able to output, we can tell they're using the legendary Worm Jets, which grants them very increased mobility whilst using their booster. There is no hit scan counter to them on Team Cryptic. They can easily shoot this champion out of the air. There's a Cassie, and with increased projectile speed, yeah, they might be able to do a bit more damage there, but she's still gonna have a hard time on Bomb King as well. It's tough. It's very tough, and Dosum's finally getting himself on board, taking down Bitey on that big pick. And I was wondering, where is C1 trying to go here? It looked like he was trying to make a cheeky move with another step possibly around the world. Not the case, he's playing a little bit more inside the line as he colors through, and finds a nice pick on the board. It's another big one to go through, reversal thrown up. He's right here with his frontliners, and you can see Stolze sees the opportunity, jumps right up mid-air, and again, right in front of the base of Team Cryptic. They have not had much as far as defensive pressure goes on the opposite side of the map. They've been playing more turtle throughout most of this uh, first round. But they can afford to now. 53 seconds left on the clock for Denial to try and push this through. Stolze goes into the back line, hovers off the map, channels Dragon Punch to be able to survive and pull themselves back in. Looks for Evil Eye, but no. Shut down by Eye Drop Bodies on Inara. That'll stem the pressure coming through from Denial for the time being and Team Cryptic hold. But Shift, talk to me about the positioning and the frontline champion specifically that we're seeing this hold really come to, uh, come to terms with. I mean, again, for the side of Denial, they've been playing aggressive but not too aggressive. On the opposite side for Team Cryptic, Wordum has tried to force himself to open up an opportunity, and Eyedrop Bodies has not had as much of an impact. Anara likes to kind of keep things directly in front of her, and Wordum has been pushing it very aggressively. He's trying to match that up. He does get a kill on the fight. He does Eyedrop Bodies, and looking for this last surge is denial, but again, you can kind of see how the frontliners are just keeping themselves over to the right, a much safer part of the map perspective for them. And uh, with that countdown getting into overtime again, the full bodies are on. Will convert is being used though, and it finds a lot of damage as an opportunity for denial. Falls in three, but followed up by Dread Serpent from Team Cryptic, as well as an Ancient Rage is enough to hold things down. But Z1 Unknown finds two, and Androxus looking for a third. Makoa trying to flee. The Shell Shield goes down, but still the frontliners have returned. Bitey cleans up War Doom, is stunned in midair, looking to be able to push this through. And Inara is tanky on the objective frontline. Evil Eye returns as Bomb King trying to stall things out over time. Time is ticking, but it's frontline versus frontline on the objective, but no, Bidey gets melted. But Z1 still fragging, and Druxus, not enough. Nobody can test the payload. Defense successful for Team Cryptic, all tied up, one to one. Bold call for the convergence right as overtime was just filling up. I thought for sure both supports were just going to hold on to their ultimates, but one goes, the other goes right after it, so you do ultimate for ultimate, no convergence, no Dread Serpent for this next point, and both of them getting to above about 25%. Not really a lot gained nor lost there. It was a good attempt, and I like it. It's a bold call for Denial. They're not playing Cryptic's game. That's the seconds. big thing I've seen so far, is Denial is establishing what they want to do, and they are taking absolutely no pit stops. They're going full pedal to the metal 
taking it right to Cryptic. I love it. Enabling them to keep on doing this as well. Now, Wi-Fi is CC immune during their shoulder bash thanks to the battering ram legendary. Itemizes into that blue chain link item. Resilience to here. So they have a 60% reduction in the duration of crowd control. So they can just keep fighting. Dread Circuit comes out. Doesn't matter. They can soak a Grumpy Bomb stun and not be blown up here. But Evil Eye is going to try and come in with King Bomb looking for a backline target. Goes towards Orion. Saris shuts them down before Shadow Travel comes out. Wi-Fi asserts dominance around the outside of the objective and Evil Eye just runs away. Smart play. Really, really good, efficient play from Evil Eye. Get the ultimate off, get the kill, do a little bit of poke if you can afford to, and then as soon as you find yourself in danger, get that that big projectile of Papayam to push you away. This is really big for Cryptic. They're up to a, over 50%. Z1's trying to force himself up on the side ground, but those two players, both with Tuskini playing the Daba, and of course Dosa's with Cassie, will dissuade that very quickly. That being said, Quarter Eyes 3 already online for Denial Z1 Unknown. They can get a huge amount of shutdown on its support, and are able to do so as Body cleans up two on the objective. That's been a full retake very, very quickly. Something was going wrong there, and I feel like that was a distraction when everyone was able to put out the Cusk Beauty, just keeping them from healing up their team when necessary. Uh oh, but I would say the evil eye did miss. That pop bomb to get in the way was stuck underneath that tree. That foliage being the sixth player there, Bitey capitalizing and most of that damage is on the Hexafire as it's shadowed throughout Aero. Assault finds one on Mordoom. Can it find more? Anara able to back up very wisely. The Dread Serpent to utilize this overtime. It is 99% though, and Ash is still here with Stolze. Evil Eye back into the fight though, Box. Anything can happen. His shoulder bash will actually push. I drop bodies away. Overtime is ticking. Convergence comes through. Ooh. Beautiful impasse just to stop that pull on an eye drop body who is uh, who is now sustained fully at the front line of the objective. Seismic crash comes through, stuns out too. Wi-Fi keeps on fracking because of their resilience. Pick up kinetic burst, blows everybody away. But the respawns are good. Denial though, they capture the CC enough to push everybody out of the fight. They go up two to one so far in this fight, but they are now meeting their match. Yeah, it's looking good though as the kill feed just continues to trade back and forth, back and forth. But the fact of the matter is Bitey has been doing a very good job of, again, just dancing on the payload point. He keeps pushing himself up just to keep himself in that overtime range. And on the meanwhile, Wi-Fi on Ash has just been on the outside poking away and being the bruiser that she is. But when the crucial moment comes through as well, Wi-Fi does return to the objective and just provides the displacement crowd control to try and force things through. Speaking of, Stolze channels Dragon Punch. Impasse misses from my drop bodies. He goes through, gets a shutdown. Double kill for Stolze. Looks for the triple kill. Can't find it as Evil Eye shuts them down. The Wi-Fi picks up a double-double on the backside of this fight, continuing to pressure out Cassie, who is forced into their spawn in Team Cryptic's base. This is so dangerous. Having both a Ruckus and an Ash right in front of your spawn are the last two characters you want to see. This is so much sustained damage and of course the continual knockback that Ash can bring to the table will keep them from contesting the payload. So now we're at a minute and 23 seconds until overtime. This payload has been free pushing the entire time right as it gets to this crevice right before the base starts to open up in front of Team Cryptic's face. But still, a lot of ultimates on the board for Team Cryptic. They do have a King Bomb, Ancient Rage, and Dread Serpent to use. A lot of crowd control, but we saw how ineffective that was versus Ash previously because of the resilience pickup. And if Ash can get out of crowd control long enough to just assert dominance and draw fire for a second, it'll allow some breathing space for Denial to radio really transverse around the objective, just traverse the area and try and get into a better position to shut their opponents down. Straight in is pulled Ash. Straight in goes Bidey, contesting the repulsive field, providing a lot of damage medication and out comes Hexafire. Shut down immediately. Really good control and focus for Team Cryptic. Throwing three sticky bombs right into the face of Flighty was Evil Eye able to convert the kill with some help from his teammates. 33 seconds until overtime. And now finally Cryptic gets themselves out of that hobbled base that they found themselves in for so long. And we'll get a little bit of a zone, but again, how short this map is. You can see they're very quick to retreat. You don't want to get caught out too far away from your respawn, especially with how aggressive Denial has been playing at this point in the map. Denial could go aggressive again. They are sitting on the Dragon Punch and the Cursed Arm, and Dragon Punch will be channeled, utilizing Stolze shuts down eye drop bodies for a second time with that ultimate in a row. Z1 forcing everybody back into their spawn, but overextends. Out comes Dread Serpent to counter the push, and this should look good for Team Cryptic, as how can Denial hold as they're being torn apart at the seams, but Stolze remains alive on the front line. Ash is dancing. Wi-Fi at last goes down to Evil Eye, who picks up two. Looking for a third in a row. Pulled in is Bidey. Down they go to Cus Cutie. Overtime ticks open. And 2-2 leads the score at 10 minutes and 45. They did a decent job, though, did Denial to at least get one more ultimate out of it. Of course, they used the Dragon Punch to try to see what they could force themselves into as far as possibly 
getting that second straight point. Not able to do so. So it was, again, they're testing the waters, and again, they're forcing Cryptic to play their game. That's something we have yet to really see Denial ever do in the history of these two big juggernauts in North America, and Cryptic has been quiet. I heard in 15 seconds. They are maintaining tempo, and that's really key. As you're saying, they're keeping the ball in their court. They're dictating the pace of the game, and even if it means expending a Dragon Punch, well, we've seen how quickly that does charge straight back Five, up again. But 2-2 two two itemization three, on your screen right now. Play two, the picks coming through. One. We're seeing some rejuvenate. Increased yep. sustain from allies picked up by Team Cryptic here, but that feels more like to me, we've got some extra credits, so let's put in into something. It's not the crucial offensive itemization or maybe even defensive in this situation. It's very luxury based, but again, once again, we're seeing King Cryptic trying to establish the oh. up high. The King Bob will come up, and Ash able to trigger the shoulder bash against with that legendary you mentioned, able to keep himself, himself alive throughout it. Will actually find the kill, does Wi Fi. Two kills going the way of denial. Again, responding to the flank very nicely and getting themselves once again in control of this capture point. They're already above 30%, and there's been no contest really whatsoever from Cryptic. And Z1 Unknown just keeps on hitting shots, stalls, he charges through to try and finish off the kill on the Cassie. Z1 will claim it though. Doze ups goes down. And also, let's talk about this Androtus and their positioning because throughout the entire duration of that opening fight, as Seismic Crash is channeled, they were fighting around the enemy backline, continuing to dive, looking for kills. Z1 again finds Cuscuti. The support goes down, almost uncontested now. 90% on the objective, so close for denial, but the respawns are coming back. Clutch and headshots Double coming kill. through Wi-Fi, cleaning up kills as they come to the point. Once again, Denial Over has been so complete on how they are treating this middle portion of the map. They're getting themselves in good positions to respond to flanks. Once they get the advantage, they're pushing in very nicely, mostly at the hands of the God Slayer himself. Androx is getting into the back line, being a distraction, and allowing Stolzi some free airspace to drop all these salvos from Spitfire. And that's crucial here, although Inara won't be uh, bombarded the way just because they are CC immune during their mother's grace. Earth and God. And for the time being, Wi Fi on denial may have just overextended very slightly, but it looks like they might just survive here. Sarah's able to get a big heal off onto them. Evil Eye picks up two on Bomb King, but will it be enough to at least stand the pressure as the payload pushes further and further closer towards conversion? I think we need to see denial back off here. Team Cryptic have advanced very far forwards. But how long can they hold? We keep on seeing these conversions come very, very close. Denial are sitting on at least three ultimates, and also the all-important conversions is at 60% now. It's my goodness, this is going to be really impactful what happens over the next 30 seconds. As you can see, Cryptic is trying to find their way to establish themselves forward, but at the same time, do it passive. It's the most passive aggressive thing I think I've ever seen. Z1 picks up thing on Doza. Stolzi is well able to convert on Cuscoon. It's a big pick. High drop bodies now is a little out of position with no healer, and this is going to be very prime for now to find this pick if they can muster it. But I drop bodies is staying alive. They need to find this pick as soon as possible. Now, finally, the Androx is played by Z1. We'll get it. We saw Buddy was in the Hex of Fire early on. They're looking to put the nail in the coffin here. If they can find a couple more picks, they might just do it. They need to. Assert Dominance is ready for Denial. That will buy some time. Wi-Fi on the high ground now has been CC, but battering Ram keeps him alive as Z1 Unknown goes on a killing spree. King Bomb comes in for Evil Eye, looks for the shutdown, but gets a single round to the back of the head and falls as well. So close! Convergence is ready. Do they have the damage follow-up? Seismic Crash used by Inara to try and shut down Wi-Fi, but they immune the crowd control again with their shoulder bash. Dredge Anchor used to break up. Oh my goodness, Z1 Unknown, but he's kept alive through Convergence. Neck and neck on the objective. We've got to see the red team contest here. They're chipping down Denial. Do they have the respawn proxy advantage or will they fall? Watch Emitter coming out for Bite. He keeps him alive for a lot longer than he should have been. You saw Dosep's committing with that dodge roll. We'll be taken out by Stolzi. He fights three. It's just up to now I drop bodies to hold off for his team. He's taking a lot of damage. The impasse wall does come out just barely to keep some damage away from him. But still, Denial is still fragging and they're still here. They are and they're kept alive by Arai on Ceres the entire time. Stolzi still in the Air. Z1 Unknown still fragging as Androxus now so low. Stolzi at last cleaned up by Cuscuti, but back on the objective is Bidey. Very mobile in the air. Looks for Evil Eye, gets the kill. Grumpy Bomb will zone on the objective, and overtime is ticking. And the respawn proximity advantage is just too much for Team Cryptic for the time being. It will take a huge misplay to shut them down, but Bidey activates Hexafire on the payload. Smacked in the back of the head by an arrow, pinned to the wall. They say 
no, but still, the respawns keep on trickling for denial. Can they hold things through? Dread Serpent used post Dragon Punch just to try and cancel things down. Oh, no, cauterize. Stolzy barely stays alive for a second and is shut down by War Doom, but still over time is ticking. Is the CC displacement enough from Ash? Battering Ram you straight into the CC movie from Mother's Grace. Inara conversion comes out again for a second time throughout this fight. Shift, this is neck and neck. This is nail biting. And no one's focusing on Cyrus whatsoever, which is why Denial is able to stay here. Mighty fighting a kill. See one another. Can they pick off the last one? Denial Esports get themselves a second map and Stolze in the upward thrust of just celebration. That was possibly the longest overtime contest we have ever seen in Paladins. And again, that man right there, Arai, stays alive for so long, keeps his team alive throughout all of that. And Denial finds a way to get that last little bit and just confused faces for Cryptic. It is just good knowledge of the champion Ceres as well. Of course, running their Mortal Reach Legendary, granting them an increased distance to restore soul. They can play safe so far back. And with a payload so close to conversion with a champion like Ash on the squad of Nile, who can just kinetic burst everybody away, you've got to focus rotating onto that objective because you lose that, you lose the game. And as a result, look at the amount of healing that Arai was able to output that game. 163,000. Cuscuti's still doing well on Maldamba, but that's an unbelievable score. It's four deaths. I mean, again, yeah. Rai was out in the back of that last fight for free for so long. Everyone on Cryptic was worried about getting the big bodies of Bitey and Wi-Fi off the point that no one seemed to realize the fact that Arai is the one they need to take down. Have someone contest for as long as possible and get Saris out of the fight. They were not able to do so. Only four deaths. I mean, no one even comes close to that. The only other person in single digits had nine deaths. And Z1 Unknown, again, who has been warming up as of late, again, playing Androxus two in a row. He finds himself really being a big impact in this last game. You know what? It's phenomenal to see Z1 back on Androxus. We usually associate him with Eevee, the champion, which he's played so much of throughout a lot yeah. of the more recent online play. But back on Andro, the champion that he made a name for himself for, back at the DreamHack qualifiers for DreamHack Summer of last year yeah. and performing incredibly well. I love the tactics and style that he uses with Androxus, though. Recognizing that Nether Step provides him with limited, uh, a, a limited period of mobility, he, tra he traverses the map very quickly on the mount to come from behind, and champions uh, like Bomb King were taken by surprise. Yeah, and Evil Eye is, again, one of those people that you want on Bomb King. He had a very solid game. Oh, yeah. But again, it just came down to the fact you mentioned it. The Androxus was a huge counterplay into what he was able to do. Again, we have yet to see really anyone at all pull off big monumental king bomb ultimates and again it's one of those high risk high reward situations where you are forced to put a character with not a lot of health into the fray of everything and if you don't connect onto at least two different players with that stun you very easily can be taken down before any kills are found two games in a row that kept on happening once for stolzy once for evil eye but evil eye's performance was certainly supreme on bomb king really that game felt more to me like a battle of can we take the supports down and then can we kill the frontliners? Yeah. And that was very much emphasized and exacerbated during that last overtime push, as that's really what it came down to, is just the repeated stagger out of base, the frontliners returning, buying time for the rest of the respawns, and finding picks around the peripheral of that fight. But again, one of the key players for that last game on denial for me was Stolzy on Drogos, with their mobility granted by Worm Jets, able to stay alive so much around the outside of the base during that overtime push. And a lot of it was finding the right opportunities to commit to getting that damage done and knowing your team's with you. That was the big worry, I think, for a lot of people with Prince Danny not being here and being that big hit scan fragger that they've had over the course of the last few weeks is can Z1 put out the same performance that Prince Danny can on characters like Cassie, on characters like Androxus, and free up the space for Stolze to get that liberty on Bomb Kings and on Drogo's plays to where he can get that damage number that you want out of those type of characters? The answer to this game was absolutely yes. Much more complete than what we saw from game one on both ends for the damage dealers. It's just a simple fact that Stolze just played an incredible game. Absolutely, and all of Denial doing phenomenally. Team Cryptic did put up a good fight throughout the duration of that game. But again, let's go back to Frontliners for just a moment here, as one thing which did seem to hold them back was the repeated stagger nature of those Frontline respawns. And you mentioned very early on that we seem to see a difference in playstyle, with Eyedrop Bodies playing a defensive Inara and Wardoom playing an offensive Makoa not working together as yeah. a unit. I'm wondering where that uh, lack of communication might have come in. And this is kind of why I think there's still maybe a couple of question marks around Eyedrop Body's role on Team Cryptic. He only played Inara once throughout the qualifiers, and when he does play that secondary frontliner, it's typically a Ruckus or a Barrack. He 
and again, this is just very different because Wardoom is one of those I hold W kind of players where he just jumps yes. right into the fray and wants to push as much as he possibly can. Anara does not mimic that playstyle just based on the fact that her kit provides no mobility whatsoever, and a lot of her abilities are defensive or neutral kind of fighting kind of stances. And when you don't have that combined power of getting a hook and then a wall to block off the retreat, which we didn't see any of, that is a big form of just faltering under the pressure when you're trying to find these last picks. Denial just did a better job flat out. Well, also, if we consider the fact that the team composition from the squad of Denial was very much geared into not maybe being shut down by a Makoa Dredgen. Can you pull in any single member of them? If it's a Drogos, they can go straight up if they're not CC'd over an impasse. You know, Androxus doesn't really care as long as they've got those Nether Step charges. And you pull in right. either Ruckus or Inara, that, excuse me, Ash, they're exactly where they want to be in the front line. Yeah, that's exactly the case. And now a 2 0 map lead, and we will be going to Frog Isle. Both these teams have had kind of similar records as they move through the qualifiers. Cryptic, of course, has more of that Gangstar's momentum on this map. They like to get aggressive, as we've mentioned. And if they can get that ball rolling, it's a slippery slope to climb back up if you're Denial. But again, that's not been the case at all throughout this matchup. We continue to talk about Denial as being this proverbial underdog. They have a demanding lead in this best of five set. They've turned the tables. Now it is do or die for Team Cryptic. The second North American team, the first seed out of North America, could be looking at going home here if they don't find victory on Frog Isle. The draft is ready. First pick, let's see who it's going to be. Team Cryptic once again. Time's ticking. Drogos straight away from Denial. Don't give that to Stolze, they say. Not again. Not here. Uh, and again, I think it comes down to the fact that as Stolze has gone from his traditional, you know, he established himself as being an Androxus player, now fitting into the roles that his team needs with a Drogos, his Bomb King is not at the same level as his Drogos is. So if you're forcing Stolze into playing a Bomb King, I think you're going to find yourself in a better position. But again, one of the biggest factors in this last matchup, in these last two maps, has been the front line. Denial has looked so solid with the combination of Bitey and Wi-Fi thus far, and it will be a Ruckus matched up with a Cassie. Now, the Cassie is an interesting pick here, and I do like this on Frog Isle specifically. We have a map which is, whilst it has a funnel-shaped objective fight, it's rather open. There aren't a lot of corners that you can hide behind, you can poke around with shorter-range flankers with fall-off. Having a champion who just has long-distance damage, no fall-off, even if it's projectile-based, can lock off angles and avenues of entry more easily than one of those hypermobile flankers can. Cassie, a good choice for the job, and can be hypermobile when they want to be. But Team Cryptic, they have two picks to respond with. Inara and Makoa locked in again. Based on their performance with this last game, I certainly hope that they're able to pull off something a little bit better this time around. This just tells me that their mindset from the last game was not the Inara Mako was not the problem. It was the fact that they couldn't do anything against Drogos. So you take the Drogos first, yep. then you give yourself the Inara Mako. But again, you mentioned it, and I think you hit it right on the head. It was just two different play styles throughout the majority of Stone Keep, with Inara playing more passive and Mako playing more aggressive. They need to find a way here to have this similar mindset. They need to get together and just find a way to mimic one another, whether it is going to be aggressive or it is going to be more passive. They need to commit one way. And Ash coming out once again, it's three in a row for Denial and mimicked once more with Ceres. They seem to be getting exactly what they want. Evil Eye on screen looks a little bit maybe perplexed there as the Team Cryptic are now up to pick yet again. But Denial's lineup, for the most part, seems to be you know perfect for them. The Cassie, it's a bit more of a wild card pick, but we know that players like Stolze can play that to such a high degree. We may not even see the area damage come out on Denial if it's not necessary, if Team Cryptic don't draft maybe deployables or a lot of things to shoot at purely on the objective. Drafting in the Maldamba now, no surprises there. Barrack locked in as well. So, triple front wow. line cryptic. And this forces Denial to play <laughs> the Bomb King. They have to at this point. You know, it, you're not wrong. You're, it's, it's without a doubt. This is interesting because as you look at Denial, they continue to say, we're going to play our picks. You have yet to have a response for Ash and Ruckus. How are you going to respond to it in possibly game three? And there's a lot of mind games that go through that because Cryptic not only has to find a way to get themselves going, but they also have to consider that as well. They get in their own head of how do we deal with this Ash? Well, let's just take her and not put her in the fact where she can get into our backline because there is no backline. We're just going to play all frontliners. And as you mentioned, it, Bond King is the key to come back out. And if there were an instance where triple tank were gonna, was going to work, 
it would be on this map with this matchup. This looks more, again, more decent and viable for Cryptic to run this, but still, it's a huge risk being down two maps. It certainly is, and it's a very tanky game for both teams as well. If you look at the champions on the lineups, if you think about the health pools which are available, if I'm not mistaken, 2400 is actually the lowest health value for both teams, the Drogas and Cassie being yeah. matched at that. Everybody else is going to be above that value. Denial and Cryptic, they're just going to have a lot of brawl on the objective, and Denial, I feel like they're a little bit squishier, but when you factor in Repulsor Field as well, Team Cryptic might try and go straight to the objective and hold just with their pressure, but at the same time, I think the Denial can match them just purely on that damage reduction, at least initially. Uh, initially is the big key, and as we get them out of spawn, we'll take a look to see how these frontliners are going to match up against one another, and will Denial actually take the point fight or elect to pick a little bit more passively? It will be a fight right on the left-hand perspective like inside for Denial, and, and they're going to look right back in. Wi-Fi does find first blood. But still, the fact is that, again, the Drogos is being targeted out by Buddy, who's doing a really good job of target prioritizing. And even in the face of three frontliners, Denial controls the point. But speaking of target prioritization, the one thing you don't want to do in a triple tank scenario is let Barrett get established and get their turrets down, because then you have too many targets to shoot at. So that's the first pick, which Denial will go for. They just take them completely off the field and continue to roll. Playing as a group now round this Ruckus. Stolze finds another frag, and the zoning coming out from Ruckus. And Z1 unknown on Cassie is just holding team cryptic back in their base 70 percent and climbing for denial can anybody close the gap where's the movement coming from from team cryptic those ups is going to try and charge in but they're as much vulnerable to the poke pressure coming out from denial as anybody else i would be surprised if custom doesn't break his right click after this match he's got to heal so many targets at essentially the same time although a nice pull and pick off there as i drop bodies converts the pull off of z1 unknown and will allow cryptic to get some of their own death ball moving as you can see moving right up the road trying to convert and use that wall to their advantage and use this kind of natural choke point that the map provides. But still, they have a little bit of go before they even match up with Denial, let alone get to that first point. You can see everyone in red is starting to get back towards that central point, and a mistook from Dosef's not going to help. Dragon Punch has already been used by uh, Evil Eye on Team Crypt to cover. That'll shut down Wi-Fi. And as Ash with their shoulder bash available, that's the primary target, primary player from Denial, who's able to close the gap. But Denial, they activate Convergence here. Don't get a shutdown off, off the back of it, and force into Shadow Travel will be Ceres. Overtime taking the respawn from Wi-Fi is here. Good body block, good dredge anchor, keeps them off the objective and with no assert dominance available or even able to be cha uh, channeled right there, it's a good look for Team Crimson to go for capture. Good grief though, Mighty is doing everything he can to keep that stagger away and allow his team a chance to not obviously contest at that point, but to get themselves established for a defense. Really, really smart play. They were able to bait out a Dread Serpent with that as well. So, again, a lot of value has been found thus far, but still, Crimson does get the first tick on the scoreboard. Up at one nothing and he's looking for Peter King Bong out the biggest forward momentum that he wants. Seismic Crash coming out as well. It will still find a stun and with the shield right there, it will help at least convert one kill, but it is a trade at the end of it. And Evil Eye trades his life for Stolzi. It was a really, really good bit of trigger discipline there from Stolzi specifically, though. Recognizes that Seismic Crash is going to attack Nara CC immunity. And also that if he comes out of King Bomb too early, could get stunned by that, so wait long enough. And that's going to allow them just to throw a couple of extra sticky bombs out and confirm the kill. They do trade, but on the back of that trade, the Niles is what frontliner down for Team Cryptic are able to force their opponents back and now start to keep them trapped in their spawn. And if they don't allow the Barrack to go up and forward here, it'll be a good look for Team Cryptic just to be trapped continuously and the Niles by himself breathing room. A lot of breathing room, and this is why this map is such a teeter totter. You win one team fight, and all of a sudden you find yourself on the opposite side of the map. That's exactly what you'd like to see, especially if you're playing defense. It buys you a lot of time off the clock, and of course, a lot of room to maneuver with and position yourselves. Of course, not having the numbers advantage here. They are forced back. Very smart tactical retreat. Get yourself hobbled up more in your little home back here. With you can see, Bitey is using this little podium to kind of keep himself out of cover get himself more of a position to move up with his team, which he's doing right now, and you can see with under a minute. Again, Denial's getting aggressive. They certainly are, and they need to at this point, because the ultimate are charging back up again. Ooh, Team Cryptic drives up and is ready. That will already be an ancient rage. He's the forefront of this fight, and Barrett is taking a lot of damage here. Alas, I drop bodies goes down to Buddy. That's a very, very big pick, breaking that established hold around the payload, even trading out with those ups here, who has already used ancient rage. Not a bad trade so far. Denial waiting on respawns, won't be contesting just yet. They can send Ash in if necessary, but Team Cryptic are still holding at least a Dragon Punch here, which could very quickly deal with that. 
Ash very quickly could, and they're going to need to find a way if they want to get this duo to deal with Ash. Elbow, look at this. Stolze is just all in. Ezra Bajan over here, just completely away from his team. Will be picked apart. Evil Eye finding the kill, but meanwhile, all of that separation allowed Buddy to get a couple of really clutch defensive kills. Nobody from Cryptic is able to contest this point. Overtime should expire with no contest, and we'll find ourselves at a 1-1. Giving up the free, and actually, really importantly, was Team Cryptic did manage to charge a couple more ultimates there, and are now sitting on both the Dragon Punch and the Seismic Crash. Denial also were able to charge up some ultimates of their own just on defense and are now able to match their opponents, which otherwise would have left them in a deficit they could have been rolled with. Uh, and that's really big when it comes down to getting yourself in a position to fight for the next payload. Getting those ultimates up is really key, not to mention the fact that you know, the itemization in this kind of mid-game stage is going to be really big and having a couple of kill streaks on your side will help Denial even up that net worth. And as you take a look at what those items are, you're seeing a lot in yellow again. These a couple instances of Kronos. Five. Again, oh, Rai going already. with yeah, we could Three, Rai with the two, morale boost too as well, getting one. that extra ultimate charge and a couple of rejuvenates actually I saw for Team Cryptic once again. I do like the Kronos 2 to Team Cryptic, 20% cooldown reduction on a couple of the champions just to get more rotations of abilities off. And that could be devastating. The damage straight the objective will be brought in. Focus on the barrack in time being Hexafire is activated, trying to track down the dragon punch in mid-air. Giving that one up is evil eye doesn't even go in for a kill, tries to get behind the frog statue, but still perishes. And this is really good for Denial. They find another big pick as Wardroom again falls. And now Makoa is the target. You can see how many people are committing to that call. Able to get right in front of those ups and all of the frontliners fall one by one. All the King's men, all the King's horses. Oh, and there goes High Drop Bodies taking a dip as well. A nice poppy bomb. Once again, we're seeing Stolze getting number of kills. And look how aggressive Denial's being. The point still is being contested. They still haven't captured all the way. But the fact is, these triple tanks do not have the mobility to get back. And especially from the zone potential, Denial has taken complete advantage of it. And Body seems to be the zone king for this team of Denial. Just able to get out into the face of their opponents with Rockers. But Aaron Assault running them the ability to retreat when necessary is able to go back towards their team here find a little bit of safety and now with the payload already captured with seven minutes and 20 seconds of this game it is 2-1 to denial and they've already pushed a quarter of the distance looking to continue as convergence pulls in four dome shield goes down to protect team cryptic who should be able to hold from here denial should withdraw and not continue contesting but they seem to be displaying no fear whatsoever i, I think that the fact they were able to get a dome shield out of that is really big because that convergence wasn't going to find much the impass wall blocked a lot of it the fact that they're able to fade out a big defensive ult is huge. Hexafire coming out once again for Bidey. He finds one. The impasse is blocking away two more. But once again, Barrack by himself is the next target. Taken out by Z1 unknown. Bidey continuing to have his pressure on the platform right in front of the middle portion of the map. Still just a little under a minute 30. And so we get to overtime and the kills continue to funnel in for denial one by one. You know, it's really good trigger discipline of Bidey as well to recognize no targets for Hexafire. All right, I'll cancel, swap targets. Let's take down the on the front line. Barrack, shut them down with Z1 unknown and allow this payload to continue pushing. Evil Eye on Respawn charges a salvo with their Dread Hunter setup, but is quickly forced back into spawn by Stolze. The trap set up around the spawn door has got to wait for those to explode before you can force out. The salvo is not going to connect very much damage at all onto the Bomb King, his majesty himself. But the fire spit that falls up might just be enough. And Evil Eye does get the kill onto the all-important Frag King of Denial. And that extra little bit of damage that comes out from having that legendary... Ooh, big direct shot! Evil Eye taking down Wi-Fi. Killing spree for him, finding three straight. And this is exactly what you need. One character can change everything defensively. Evil Eye finding two kills. And you can see, again, this teeter totter of a map. What does this allow for positioning? Cryptic is now moving forward and getting aggressive, knowing they have a numbers advantage. They do for the time being, but if Inara is put, uh, actually picked off like this, as Zeon continues to roll in, looking for pressure, it could be very bad, but a nice dread janker will shut them down. Kill Cryptic going into Evil Eye. And the stalls the answers back. Evil Eye still fighting two, uh, two more in a row. Picks up five straight. No, three in a row remaining. right there for the Drogos here, demonstrating that they are a master of playing this combustible Nine, style. Eight, dipping up and above like seven, an attack helicopter six, above some of these walls, five, throwing out a fire spit, four, just picking down. Damage three, after damage two, fire spit onto their opponents one. again, chipping everybody down low before they can get to the objective. Team Cryptic defend with these that time around. It looks almost exactly what had happened in round one, just flip flop the teams. No contest at all for overtime whatsoever, knowing that there was way too much of an uphill battle to move forward to get to that payload. And again, you see the man right there.
right there, center screen. Huskudi has been doing a very good job as the Meldamba to keep his three frontliners alive throughout a lot of this. It's a tall task for a Tamba to just oh, yeah. continually right click and find the proper cord position to keep your team alive. Points a lot of big health pulls you're trying to sustain. Seconds. And that's not all. If you have a Ruckus diving into your backline, one of the best shutdowns you can find is potentially the uh, the snake toss, the stun from yeah. Meldamba's reload, and able to do all of those things at once. Huskudi. Yeah, he's the pasta chef, he's the noodle Three, chef himself. He's able to handle everything at once. Healing is also still exceeding, and Team Cryptic have got sufficient itemization online to call this a contest. We're going to say that offensive itemization is maxed out at this point, Shift. It's level 3 for all intents and purposes, so 97 healing reduction on both sides, but ultimate's being channeled by either team. Dragon Punch finds Bidey, unstoppable, goes Evil Eye, but solely shuts them down. That's a big advantage, though, for Cryptic, able to take out one frontliner when you have three. Again, it allows you to stay in that frontline for so long. Big battle in the trenches is going to go the way of Cryptic now, and again, that's going to lead to very early capture percentage, which is going to lead to them being in favor for the next team fight. You know, it's just it's a domino effect. What that means, just one ultimate, and how it impacts the entirety of this game. Dome also being taken up to the point just to make sure nobody from the now can commit their bodies to being on top of it. And now Frag is coming out for Team Cryptic. And this is really important as well. Convergence used by Denial finds no ground. War Doom shuts down Z1 unknown. Cuts Beauty with the Dread Serpent just to stay alive. Team Cryptic capture. Stop objective number up. three of this game. They're still in the fight shift. They're still holding things down. And maybe, just maybe here, they can find a conversion to win out game three and keep themselves in the set. Denial needs a defense here. Absolutely needs to take this three. If they get pushed on, you can hear Team Cryptic starting to get the energy amped up. That's what you do not want. They're still the favorite seed and hold the edge in this matchup in the history of Paladin between these two North American squads. Oh, and if they do not get this push going all the way through, it's going to, again, keep the on a snail. And Denial's going to have a good chance to control this In order to do that, you're going to have to see the support oh. channel. Maybe shut down bodies, bodies, bodies. Stays alive. War Doom. Bodies. Stolzy in the King Bomb as well. And with that shutdown in mind, I drop bodies on a 15 streak on Barrack right here. The stay at home dad, as Evan likes to say, just staying alive. Fire spit for our team. Oh, Backline gets an immediate shutdown onto a Rye. No sustain for Denial. And this is not looking good for Denial. They need to get themselves grouped up. You see, they're all sitting in spawn, waiting for their healer to come up and take the advantage of that positioning. All these frontliners are right in front, welcoming Denial with a lot of damage as soon as they exit the spawn. And you can see Cryptic is doing a really good job of getting the targets they need down low. If not getting kills, once again, Evil Eye finds Bitey. And that's huge. The Dragon Punch is straight on the front line. Those ups as well stays alive. Venture Rage goes straight towards Ash, who is in a certain dominance, immune for the time being, but now taking a lot of damage. Battering Ram as well, as the Mortal Reach will keep her alive for a brief moment. But shut down again. Evil Eye finds two off the back of one salvo. The payload continues. Convergence pulls in everybody on Team Cryptic, but down goes the Shell Shield. The Barricade. Can anybody contest from Denial? Just the frontliners are alive. Hexafire from the skies is immediately evaporated by War Doom, Dread Serpent for the zone. The wall is perfect, the impasse is here, but the respawns come back on through. Denial contesting momentarily, but the payload, was it forced through? It looks to be that way. Team Cryptic finds themselves that really monumental second straight point. And this is, that's not good for Denial. Momentum has just completely swung back into Cryptic's court. It was, it's been a really good start for Denial. They put up a really good fight throughout that, but the three tank, too strong to deal with, especially once they started to isolate, get Bitey off the board, get Wi-Fi off the board. You can see the damage coming out. Even in the three tank is, is a lot. 104,000 for Evil Eye and just over 70,000 apiece for War Doom and I Drop Bodies. And I feel like Evil Eye happens to be the crux player for this team of Team Cryptic there. What they are able to do, Shift, is they are able to turn a three versus two uh, frontline stack into a three versus one, one frontline yeah. stack by taking out champions with just that single ultimate. And you made the remark of saying it doesn't matter if you lose one of your damage champions if you trade out with a frontliner because you just have more sustain. You're harder to kill. You're on the objective for long and the objective is what wins the games. Phenomenal play for Team Cryptic. Two to one, down in the set versus Denial, but they're still in the game. Yeah, I never thought I'd see the day where Denial was able to do as well as they had, but the fact of the matter is, once again, you have a player like Tosa pictured here who is just so good at going back and forth between playing Cassie last game and getting himself on a front line this game, hitting a lot of really clutch hooks 
as that Makoa. Very much. We saw in at least a couple of the last point fights that Dredgenk is used to displace Bitey, who had been such a thorn in the side of Team Cryptic up until that point, were very, very key at ensuring that the shutdowns came down as well. Also, over 100,000 shielding yeah. from just a Makoa, playing more of the half-shell style, able to recognize that with Triple Tank, the, uh, the utility that Makoa provides is far more valuable if they're able to keep on pumping that out. So utilizing the shell shield at the same time as Dredgenka, really, really key to keep themselves in the game. And Bitey on screen right now, looking perplexed, looking to try and find some solution in map number four for Denial to not be forced to game five and have it all come down to the wire. Yeah, and that's, again, a situation that if you're Denial, you want to try to keep this in your ball court as much as possible. You do not want to let this get out of hand and start going the way of Cryptic because they will surge on that emotion that they, I mean, they're a very emotional team. Oh, much You so. hear them yelling and screaming and they get really vibrant with one another and they feed off of that. It's something that a lot of people have taken into criticism, but they love it. They love that energy. They love getting themselves up to that high BPM and just get themselves on that frag train. I mean, it's just, it's one after another. One person starts it, the next follows in line. And then if you get all five dudes on their game, they are a very dangerous team and they're on really close to doing that at the moment. But comparatively, that can be dangerous, right? If we end right. up with the momentum shifting in the other ways we saw initially, it takes a lot of strength of character if you are a very emotional and driven team like that to be able to come back from the deficit. And previously, we have seen teams such as Team Cryptic be unable to do that. So the, ma the mental fortitude which these players have has certainly increased over the last few weeks, over the last few months of competitive play. And they've definitely put themselves in a spot to maybe go for the reverse sweep. As we see, the fourth map is available on your screens right now. It's Frozen Guard. I like it. Uh, it's just, again, a, it's one of those areas that both of these teams have matched up with a bunch of times before. And again, it kind of has that Bright Marsh feeling in the beginning because that Ice Castle in the middle Seven. provides a lot of frontline battle where if you can poke for safe on the outside, you'll find yourself in an advantage. But that big upfront trench battle is what we've seen a lot of these maps be determined by. There's, again, really no other comparison. And then doing it here, uh, it's just there's oh my goodness this is this is a really crucial matchup and again with how well both Bitey and Wi-Fi have been playing again they've been able to handle this two on two front line very well and this isn't a map where you can run three front liners if you're no cryptic. this is certainly not it's a map where there just is too much time we can run it on more compact maps Frog Isle a lot of long line of sight but the map itself is relatively tight knit when it comes down to the overall spacing with especially the payload push on Frozen Guard. A lot of yeah. traction for teams to try and push through. You need the long distance damage to be able to dissuade your enemy from advancing or force your way through so you can poke them around cover as they sit on top of their base. I'm expecting champions like maybe Shaolin to come out here. We might see the Knesset. Yeah. We've got to see either high mobility or very effective range damage. But I'm just wondering, are, do we have sniper players on both of these teams who might be willing to go in for the Bounty Hunter? Oh, without a doubt. I mean, Knesset very well could come out. We've seen, of course, C1 has played a very good Kinesa uh, for, no, well, not with Denial, but on his own personal stream before. He's he's dirty. He's he's really good at Kinesa. And this an opportunity. And f similarly, we might see an instance where Grover might come out for Cus Cutie. This is a map where Grover becomes very viable because, again, the long lines of sight towards the central point. And on top of that, the ability to vine in close to a corner, keep yourself out and blossom your team for essentially free and get right back out. There's potential for these out of, we'll say, meta picks. It just kind of comes down to how confident are either of these teams feeling when it comes to these less seen champions. And if you're going to pull out a less seen champion, well then, looking again at potentially the set point for the squad of Cryptic, maybe now is the time to do it. If you've got nothing left in the tank, you might have to pull something out a little bit different. Yeah. The map draft has already gone by. We're on the Frozen Guard. The champion draft is ready. Shift first pick this time around should be going to denial if i'm not mistaken but we'll have to see yeah they, again things can get changed based on what they prioritize whether they want to take the first overall or the second and third exactly is the rockers that valuable is maybe yeah, the drovers that valuable or do you want the counter pick on this map to maybe pick maybe an evie in to stop the knesset from getting free reign it's, it's tricky it's very tricky and you bring up evie who very well could come out again we've talked about z1 and his kind of wild card approach that we have with this denial squad it will be ruckus for the first pick for Denial. So a, a very standard pick we've seen for a lot of teams thus far here in Valencia. And Cryptid looking to respond. Again, they've been opted to go with this Inara Makoa. Will they do the same here 
Of course, with those little uh, archways that enter into the central point, there will be some value out of impasse if Anara does come out. It will be a Cassie, though, first. Interesting choice. So stripping that away from Z1, who did have a relatively good game on it previously, also putting that potentially back into the hands of Doe, as well as drafting a Makoa early on. And the Makoa, and as, like the Rockers, at this point, they feel like the neutral picks, the frontliners that don't give away your pocket strategies or any of the flavor picks, which could come later in the draft, establishing a strong core here. Vital for both teams. Denial have two picks with which to respond. Do you think we're going to see a support this early, or maybe something different in terms of the damage flavor picks? I think you're going to see a, probably a support come out for, I would imagine, Denial at this point in time. Ooh, not, not the case. Again, they've been doing this, though. They have been staying away from picking their support first, saying we don't mind playing either Ceres or Maldamba. They'll play either. They, yeah, exactly. And Cryptic has been primarily resilient on getting that Maldamba in their hands. But the fact is, we have seen one front line, no support for Denial. So what does Cryptic decide to show, and what do they hold for their last overall pick? Well, it's going to be crucial here to bear in mind the Denial. They're likely to get, they're going to be running a two frontline composition. They're going to need to get a support online. That only really leaves one pick left open for them. So they've really already shown their hand. And in doing so, Team Cryptic could be able to draft away the frontline, which might work out very well with Ruckus on a map like Frozen Garden. That's going to be Inara for Team Cryptic again, going with more of what they're used to, what they're familiar with. Again, making sure that the impasse doesn't go into the hands of maybe Denial who could be utilizing it very, very well on the objective capture. And in turn, they're able to have a little bit more freedom as they do have last pick here as well and could go with something strange. I'm interested to see if they continue to go with Ash, Denial does, or if they decide to pick up in this instance a Barrack who could be very valuable on the payload push path. And it will, in fact, be a Barrack. So interesting, they're staying away from the Ash. Again, does not have a lot of value here. You're really not knocking people back into much else besides walls. Well, it's, yeah, it's the... an enclosed point. Yeah, it's like, exactly. okay, I knocked you into the igloo. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> from, from one side of the igloo to the other side. It just really doesn't matter. I from Frostbite. Though. Oh my goodness. Maybe, maybe. Impactful plays, should we say. But Let's talk to Martini about that. Not so much. <laughs> Barrack, though, locked in. I do like the utilization potentially of Barrack's Dome Shield Ultimate here on this objective point. It's relatively compact and it covers a lot of area. Useful for, uh, for confirmation and conversion of objectives, as well as the turrets around the corners can take you by surprise. Oh, without a doubt, and there are a lot of cheeky corners where you can hide those turrets. Not to mention the fact that the turrets don't just provide damage. Most players will utilize that healing station card, and so that actually takes a little bit of stress away from your support player where you can just get around a corner and not only keep yourself away from damage, but also bolster up your health pool by getting that healing station turret to get you back closer to full HP. And considering the fact that Ceres is just single target support, she's not multi-champion healing, that's going to be very crucial, so Ceres can focus their attention to maybe the Androxus, the Drogos, the Ruckus, who are playing these mobile champions that are going to be trying to flank around the outside of the map. Team Cryptic, though, speaking of mobility, have drafted some of their own with a Bomb King last pick. As we get into game, we'll have to see exactly how this one plays out. The players are ready. Team Cryptic, again, must find victory here to continue the set and even up the scores. Denial could take it all. Indeed, and you're seeing some of Five, the instances of how four, tight that three, igloo, that, two, that big ice castle is one. in the middle, and how long this payload begin. path is as they advance their way forward and up aforementioned path. And seeing what Denial will opt to do as far as they have yet to really commit straight to point, but that's actually what they're doing this time through, getting the forward pressure right into the teeth. And Team Cryptic wants to go, and moving first blood for Joseph's on the outside for free. I do like Cassie's positioning here. Well, to be unmitigated, now turns their attention. The Stolzy in the air, who does retreat. Those are not overextending here is very crucial. Not letting themselves be vulnerable to Z1MO on the flanker. Androxus and gets a shutdown on it to Androxus themselves in combination with Wardu. Now looks for and finds Stolzy in the air. Team Cryptic are in dominating control of this objective and the positioning of Anara here. I love it. Yeah, and this is a really good spot. Again, we mentioned the fact that that impact wall can be very big you get to that underpass where they have to choose one side or the other an impasse can block off to go with 93 percent for team cryptic not much contest yet for denial they are getting close to the point but again the shields the boards everything keeping up the red team very full and wi-fi does fall on barrack not looking good so far for denial also crucial we just saw the impasse come out to block off the line of sight being available from saris as well so Wardim doing a good job at controlling space for their team that's right for that one it's Dolzy looking for a frag onto somebody that gets shut down by dozos once again we'll see how the front line is gonna be uh mccullough here just trying to lock things down dozos double kill now slowed by the waters field his wife by just trying to dodge around but eventually goes down to evil eye Team cryptic first capture the game it goes through the red told you how dangerous it is to let cryptic get their momentum on board you can hear them getting 
All that energy, the yelling is starting to come out. We hadn't heard much as of yet, but the kill streaks are high. You can see the top right of your screen, all of those glowing numbers associating with straight kills. Yeah, but you say that Cassie is on a roll. A very big roll. Yeah. I'm not going down that much. Lunge, lunge <laughs> full. Lunge full. <laughs> Maybe so. We'll have to see the loadouts a little bit later. But do not. It is up to them to mount a defense here. But caught by surprise. Stolzy shut down by the bonus damage. Incitement exactly shot. Looking to reset the dodge ball, move out, those up to save to keep themselves mobile and safe. Hexafire, caught by surprise from the side again, will force back Team Cryptic, but still taking a lot of damage from the peripheral of this fight. He is full of denial, they've got to be very careful, and now I drop bodies goes in as Makoa trying to get damage onto somebody, but melee base Makoa is in a lot of trouble here as Saris tries to keep the rest of denial alive, but still Z1 is picked up. Big dredge anchor, and this is what I'm looking at right now, is who's going to match up with those ups? No one's contested him yet. Someone's got to step up and say, I'm going to take this pick with Cassie. Stolzy does find a big pick on Evil Eye, very low on his health. Ooh, as I just barely able to get away, but stays a little bit longer than intended. And again, Dosep's finding himself some success. Wi-Fi's turn, plus that blunderbuss will convert the kill onto Dosep's right in front of that payload, which has exceeded past the underpass, and is now right in front of the base. Very, very close. And now, we're forced to use a few of their ultimates that previously, such as Convergence, to try and hold things down. Team Cryptic sitting currently on just the King Bomb, but Dread, uh, Dread Serpent is rising there, 69% and climbing for the Maldama. Now at 74. Very, very quick is charging Cascudi as able to do a lot of damage on Maldama if set up correctly, but also provide a lot of sustain and support for their team. And with these two aggressive frontliners, there's definitely no shortage of ultimate charge. Not at all. And this is going to be interesting to see how Cryptic decides to get back on his Halo points. Stolzy doing a very good job. You can see using this Stolzy to go for his on the left side of the map, getting some free damage, and again, just kind of poking and prodding at these frontliners. And again, forcing Aldama to utilize all these cooldowns to keep everyone relatively healthy. Another big salvo connects, and he comes right back over the barricade into the safety of his base. If you want to know, trying to find something like Bronx, but again, Joseph is right up here with him and continues to really yeah. win these fights. Nine. Dodgeball being used against the wall just to get the bonus damage, converting it, and now looking to convert onto Droxus himself. Many will win that fight looking for more, but will be shut down by Stolzy. Good response as Dome Shield is dropped right under the payload by Denial. And that's a very big commitment from Denial, just to try and get a stall coming out. It is only one ultimate used out of all of the available, and over time is to uh -oh. Team Cryptic. But Team Cryptic still have two frontliners here. Saris utilizes conversions to pull people in. This is so much committed by Denial as they try, and the Cursed Arm as well, they're trying to strip the momentum from Team Cryptic, but they're holding on to their own. Seismic Crash is available. Cassie with Scout and King Bomb for Evil Eye. This could be big. Overtime is still in contest, and out we, uh, comes the Stone Warden with Seismic Crash. This is looking very familiar to Stone Keep. Nobody's focusing on Maldava, able to get a lot of extra healing onto Inara, who is the only person who was there for a long time. This overtime continues to extend and extend, and every time that that happens, one step away from that is completely diminish all of the overtime. The longer it goes, the faster it goes away. And now Evil Eye using this drop drop to try to get everyone away from the point where he faced the fear of the stun. And still, a double kill for Evil Eye. They're right in here. Ancient Rage is being used right on top of the point. A big pull once again by I Drop Bodies who is using that anchor as that giant melee. Cleave finds another kill. Overtime is still here as Saris is in shadow travel, but it's not going to last forever. Arai is contesting other respawns enough. A nice impasse blocks off line of sight. Good dredge anchor away. Back to the objective goes Wi-Fi, but shut down. And now the aerial assault will actually take them out of contest range. This is dangerous for Bitey. He has to stay on the payload. He can't remain behind oh. the mobile. Dread Surfer for Team Cryptic comes through. The shutdown from I Drop Bodies. Evil Eye finds one of the souls as well. The impasse trying to cut line of sight is successful. Z1 unknown goes down. Team Cryptic 2-0 on this map 4 of Frozen Guard. I don't know how I could say it enough. Supports are so important. And if they stay on the board really? for so long, it all... <laughs> I know. Don't surprise. Say. Surprise. Shocking. Seeing Cutie again kind of positioning himself in those mines, just tossing out Gord's, peeking, getting his right click, coming back. No one's focusing on him, and that allows Inara to stay in the fight for as long as she was able Point to. The rest of Cryptic gets seconds. there. They force out good picks. Evil Eye finds a massive double kill. And that leads to, of course, the 2-0 result we see on the scoreboard. Well, posing a question to you, Stolzy rotated on Drogos to shut yeah, down uh, Maldamba. Four, one shot away, turns three, their attention back towards two, the objective. Itemization one. on your screen very briefly. We'll come back to that in just a second. Most importantly, 
Although it is a 2-0 for Team Cryptic so far, Cauterize 2 has been matched, the anti-heal has been matched for both teams, so the supports are equivalent in their effectiveness here. They're not seeing a lead from one spot to the other, but Mighty though, all into danger, a lot of troubles, he's got an answer back, rid of the curse down, finds those ups only, but he like, gets to shut down, Dragon Punch traded out, double kill for this Evil Eye Bomb King, looking into the back line for somebody, anybody finds a Saris, lands one shot, forced to reload, but Wi-Fi being brought very low, surely to fall here on Barrack, and they do the damage from Wardroom Zinar, Grumpy Bomb to force the Saras out from their corner positioning. Gotta rotate here and into Shadow Travel they go. A repeat deja vu of the last objective capture shift. 51% and climbing for Team Cryptic. This is looking really good again for Cryptic. You see Evil Eye is just such a master at moving horizontally on this map. Going from one side of the map to the other whenever he feels it's necessary. He can get damage to stay alive. King Bomb coming in right into the face though. That Hexafire taken out immediately. Finally, shields and walls come up to keep Cryptic away from all of those guns from Ruckus. But he's found two kills. It has a lot of damage onto possibly a third. Stolze will clean that one up. Still, I drop body is able to find one pull, but falling very low in his own health pool. Bitey finding another kill, and now Denial swinging things back in their favor as they get the full team wipe, stalling out Cryptic at 81% and getting themselves a much needed point. Stop. Able to capture so fast as well, thanks to the comeback mechanic in effect, keeping themselves in the game. Denial denying their opponents the 3 0 run on back 1 2. Talk about that Hexaflash shift. How pivotal was that? Huge, especially in the face of a King Bomb being channeled, you know that you can sit there and usually survive the damage, but most importantly, avoid the stun. He did a really good job of getting near the flank, finding an open line of sight towards the back line, and just changes targets based on who wants to put themselves in harm's way. Finding three total kills in that exchange of the five-man team wipe. Still, this is looking good denial. This is, they have a lot to deal with at the same point. Kirby is getting aggressive and is right in front and taken out of the Dragon Punch before it goes off is Stolze. Nice shot from Dosa. Really good to get that shut down, but very importantly, Dragon Punch still available. Stolze not finishing the channel time of Dragon Punch before being killed. So as soon as they return to the fight, there may be a more appropriate opportunity for that ultimate to be used. And see on unknown here, rocking if I'm not mistaken, the the stage four Androxa skin here with the uh, the loving revolver there as well from Valentine's Day. Chest is able to try and find a flank back as they like to, while still mounted with Master Riding in effect. Cauterize 3 is a mid round buy, now online as well for Denial. This is going to be big in helping extend that, their lead potential just in terms of healing effectiveness, but is it going to be enough here to just keep the devastation play? Yeah, I think when it comes down to it, Z1 needs to get in the face of getting into dose-ups, cast again, cast is finding kills left and right. And Z1, you just saw, was poking from the outside, just kind of shooting and getting cauterized, but now finally getting a convert to kill onto dose-ups. So at 50 seconds, Denial does control the positioning and the numbers on the field, and you can see the payload is just starting to move underneath this underpass and get towards its potential final destination. This is something that if you're going to see it broken open, it's going to take ultimates at this point. And the big key ultimate here will be ultimates like Dragon Punch for Denial. Excellent. Being used by Body picks up Evil Eye yet again. Was that in response to a King Bomb? Uh -oh. The jewels in the mines as well. So close. Those ups clutches Z1 unknown, and Androxus goes down. The God Slayer no longer alive. The Rex Spray pulled out in victory celebration, and a big 910 damage shot found onto the front line of Nile as well. But in a really bad position because of that 1v1 was Dose Ups. They stagger him very closely away, and this payload is moving. It's got its front wheels right on top of the circle. Can they get those last couple of inches? Overtime will be in effect. Dreadsilver does come out. You can see Cryptic is right on top of the point. The Dragon Punch will also find Wardum. A huge pick, but once again, a massive pull out of midair. Cause Cutie converts on Stolze. It's just conversions back and forth. Shadow Travel activated and immediately canceled by Arai and just keeping everyone alive as long as possible, but just not enough blue bodies around, especially ones of the frontline nature, so it continues to be a two-point deficit. Cryptic up 3-1. And that was very important there, that Stolze was plucked out of the sky. If the Drogos had remained alive, then the damage may have been enough to overpower Team Cryptic. But eliminating that pick made the frontliners a lot more vulnerable. Then they can be focused, because you no longer have the, Drog uh, the Drake, the Lizard, zooming around the skies, dropping bombs on you with their worm jets. You can just purely focus down the Ruckus. And even with Emitter, even with Repulsor Field, one versus five, that's a tall Point order to try and fight for. Very seconds. tall order, and very unlikely in overtime of all things to get that advantage you need to get those last couple of meters. Going into this fourth round now, it's, Five, again, it's four, pretty interesting to see three, what two, they decide to do as far as opening strategies. We've seen kind of 
both Rams just charging at one another right on top of the point. Not a lot of attention being paid to the flanks. And once again, it will be Cassie. But it's Ardosa on the screen for the left, but is going to get matched out by Buddy, who is taking this perspective right side for him. King Bomb and Seismic Crash used in tandem by Team Cryptic. They want the tempo. They're going to seize it. Excuse me, Convergence used by Saris, but CC newly from Gozart in their scout is too much for that to be dealt with. Eliminated is a lie there. Shutting out support is very good, but Denial stay alive. And the Moan and Buddy finding kills of their own. It's stuck on the body. It's just Wi-Fi trying to contest, but Z1 is still alive. Can they find a pick on the Tusk Beauty here and take down the all important support? I don't think so. And so far, Team Cryptic, they're still holding the edge in this fight. But nobody's standing on the point right now, Vox. There's no one who can. There's no frontliners that are up. So the damages are just looking at each other through these arches until finally you can get the Makoa on the point. It's again, favoring Team Cryptic looking for a pull. We'll find one on the Bitey and immediately try to convert the kill. They will do so. Ancient Rage being used. C1 I don't falling very low, but does catch a very clutch heal. It's just not enough as Dozeps finds two. I drop bodies with another. It's nearly a full team wipe for Cryptic as they get themselves now above 70% with that fifth and final kill. Just the last fadeaway arc shot there from I drop bodies. The full house wipe for Team Cryptic. 93% of climbing. Just body blocked and pulled in is by the brutal play from Team Cryptic. The emote at the end there as well. Pulling themselves back in. They've tied themselves up 2-2 two two in this set. We're forcing a game five. I think the biggest thing that Cryptic did that game was switch Wordoom and I drop bodies between yeah. the NR and the McCullough. That that's, works. That's the first time we've seen it. And I drop bodies hitting so many clutch dredge anchors. And on top of that, Wordoom playing a really good NR. You can see the stats between both those frontliners just above 60,000, 83,000 damage for Evil Eye. And really, again, it's just a, a complete game for Denial. It's just the fact the front line did not win the battles. But also, look at the difference between supports this time around. Cus Beauty had a game like a ride on Stone Keep, unmitigated. 160,000 healing on the board. Able to keep oh, their front, line, front lines alive through all that fragging and was able just to stay alive themselves, sitting at only three deaths the entire duration of that game. Arai, again, only found five, but it feels like the Maldamba was just more effective with their area healing, able to hit more targets at once than the single target. And there we go, Premier Qualifiers coming out in first place, showing us a little bit of love on the screen. And semi-finalists for the Master's Land and the HRX Invitational, this is a seasoned veteran of Paladin's play, one of the first competitive players from DreamHack Summer last year as well. Well, on top of that, and this was a stat that we barely touched. He was at almost 100,000 healing after the first round, or when won one. Oh, yeah. He was right there at almost 100,000 healing. It's ridiculous. It's five minutes into the game, he's got almost 100,000 healing. How do you do that? Teach me. No, I'm asking. I'm not even... No, this. serious. So, yeah, how, how, do you, how do you do that? I, I don't know. Maybe it's Cus Cutie in the famous stack. He plays in Maldamba like he... Really? Pit, goes, stack on the gourd. Stand there. <laughs> You've got to stay on this gourd. No, but uh, he's aggressively at times as well. Not a Maldamba that isn't afraid to get their hands dirty and look for a shutdown with a snake yeah. toss or potentially just some raw damage to follow up and dread up and if necessary, very much controlling the pace of the game. And Cus Cutie is a player who's talked about this multiple times before, has made the trade from initially, again, all the way back at DreamHack Summer last year, was one of the best Androxus players in the world. He's certainly a player of frag nature, but was always a support at heart. They like the way that they control the pace of the game with the ability uh, to keep people sustained as a support, and we'll have to see if that continues in map number five. That's right, we've come all the way to the end of this set. It will be Serpent Beach, where everything concludes. Appropriate for the Snake Master. I, I would absolutely agree. And this is kind of what I had a feeling was going to happen, again, with these teams being so close, even though the records might not show it over the last couple weeks in their qualifier matches. All of the games have been like 4-3s, 4-2s, and comes down to one or two team fights. We're seeing an echo of that here, even though we've seen a lot of 4-1s coming through. The fact of the matter is both of these teams have explosiveness built into who they have playing for them, and when you get certain characters on certain champions, it could be all over, as we've seen Kuskini do a good job, but Evil Eye as well on Bomb Kings. I would say it's fair to call these players uh, definitely characters at this point, since they certainly oh, yeah, bring absolutely. a lot of personality, but the way that they play these champions as well, you know, the difference between Evil Eye's Bomb King and Stolzy's Bomb King, very, very different. They play them completely in separate yeah. manners. And it's that mannerism which can often help uh, maybe define some of these players from being a top tier player, to the best in their class at specific champions. That's certainly what we expect and want to see also on a world stage here at DreamHack Valencia Summer 2017 with the Paladins Summer Premier.
It's been an amazing set so far between these North American juggernauts, and alas, it must come to a conclusion. Shift, Serpent Beach, what kind of map dynamic is that going to bring to the table? It's a lot of what happens in the high ground. I think you're going to start seeing, again, you're going to see a Drogos, you're going to see a Bomb King, but who else can get up there? Aerial Assault Rokas has been a big factor for both of these teams as we jump over to the draft. It will be first pick for Denial, and they do pick up that Ruckus. So important for Coach to get that Ruckus and Bolt going. I also feel like maybe just don't give it to Cryptic as well, based on some of the sure. performance we've seen previously. It's too much of a risk at this point, but Androx is very highly prioritized by Cryptic here. Don't give that to Denial, they say. Don't give that to Z1, but also we'll control the high ground with that ourselves, as well as Makoa. Now, we could see Adro Bodies flex potentially onto either of these champions. Uh, it's going to be quite confusing to see how Cryptic lay these out from draft to players. That's a very strong point that I really wasn't considering is the fact that eyedrop bodies can go between both of those characters. And if they do opt to go with another, like a Nara choice, will they continue to keep what they have no works now with the uh, Nara being played by War Demon, Makoa by eyedrop bodies, but we're all speculating at this point as Drogos and Cassie are picked up in the meantime. A lot of damage picked up early on. It really kind of doesn't hold the hand whatsoever for Denial, as you know they have to take a support in their fourth and probably another frontliner for their fifth. So interestingly enough, it will be the Maldama that is locked in and then the Vianara, as you remarked, so double frontliner online, I drop bodies. Based on their previous record on Makoa in that last game on Frozen Guard, I would be very shocked to see them switch off of that. But still, we know that on this squad, Dozops has uh, flexed between that previously as well. And now Denial answering back with picks of their own. Ceres locked in, unsurprising, as the last two picks do come yeah. through. And it is Ash on Serpent Beach, and this is an interesting pickup on the map specifically. A few environmental hazards which could come into play. That's really not the focus of this team here. They want to be able to get up close and brawl and make sure that they're taking the fight, Denial are taking the fight to Cryptic rather than Cryptic taking the fight to Denial. We've seen how much momentum affects both of these teams. Whoever is in control of the game's tempo will often have the lead. I think the other big thing too with Ash is she has her ultimate available. She can solo contest the point while everybody else is getting maneuverability and positioning on their opponent. It will be a Bomb King as the last selection. Again, we have not really seen too many picks fall out of what have been the favored 10 champions um, over the last couple of weeks. The Ash, of course, throwing a little bit of mix-up over the last week and a half, and Wi-Fi has done a very good job, you know, kind of going back and forth of using the Ash when necessary or using the Makoa when available. Not the case here, and it's going to be interesting to think. I, I, again, this comes down to, will Z1 have a solid game on Cassie, and will Drogos be utilized properly by Stolze by getting some of these big health pools of either Makoa or Inara off the table with a Dragon's Punch? They're going to be so under pressure, though. We do have an Androxus from Team Cryptic on a map like Seven yes. Beach. This Androxus, especially if running maybe the legendary oh. Darkstalker with still linked charges in OB52, is going to be hypermobile, able to dodge out their direct shots and easily lock down the Lord of the Skies, becoming the Edge Lord of the Skies himself. But we are into game. It is Team Cryptic who are on the right hand side of the draft. Denial Three, fighting out of the blue two, corner this time. One. It all comes down to this and shift so of the smiley face begins. on the side of the base to kick things off in this final game of the best of five quarterfinals set between the two North American teams. Good opening movement from Evil Eye with that accelerant popped up with the sword. Dose up does find first blood, able to get a dread dagger against C1 and Evil Eye staying alive. Even though again you could see how many members from Denial were committed to taking him down. Now they're in the ones who are in danger from spots as Stolzy with some combustible able to get a big spitfire off. Trying to get more on top of the point. Looks to be using the worm yet, so they're trying to stay hyper mobile. I could pick up, I think, with an Androxus on board, but Idrop Bonnie's already finding the damage on the Wi Fi. Turns around, preemptive reversal, catches the fire spit and stays alive. And now look at their, uh, their health. Straight back up to 2000. Tusky keeps them alive, and Bodies proving to Z1 unknown that they certainly know how to play, play this champion just as well as they do. Forcing out even Bitey on Ruffus. He's in a lot of danger here now with no support. Every shot hit, Idrop Bodies getting the kills. Looking fresh, too, on this damage dealer. has been playing a lot of front line today so far. No hesitation, jumping onto the God Slayer and getting the damage right away. And again, just good pulls. Continue to come up for Dosis. He confirms that shot as Ash is trying to push him away. Saris in some trouble will go into Shadow Travel, and I Drop Bodies will take the high ground. 
right in front of spawn, but ooh, Cassie is sneaking around and will come back. Z1 finding a big pickup, numbers advantage to Denial. Has to find a pickup there. If Z1 didn't find a kill, that would have been a thorn permanently in the side of Denial's, uh, well, side at that point. Maybe in that flank, because it was also a new flank pickup, but now we're going to see Z1 try and return some of the damage, return some of the favors, which so far I dropped body has, has been pushing onto all of Denial, but meets their match with Bomb King. The positioning from Team Cryptic is very good here so far, taking the high ground control, but straight to the back one again is I drop bodies. You can never leave your backup when Andrew is around, a cursed arm. Looks for Saris, does not find the kill, and maybe here bodies will fall, but still and staying alive. Yeah, this is looking good for Cryptic. They're staying focused and controlled, even though there's a lot of flank pressure coming out from both Stolzi, and of course, you can see that as he won. They've been able to respond very nicely. Hydra Bodies has been doing a very good job of moving all over the map to help out whenever possible. Beautiful and then when he's got the positioning to move through and be an individual, he's been doing very well there as well. All the while, Custody helping the team live conversions used by Saris, though, from Denial to try and hold things down. Even though Arai falls, that might have been enough to stem some of the pressure. Wi-Fi also electing to use their Assert Dominance here to try and stand their ground off the edge of the map. Maybe goes Makoa, but no. They will stay alive with Shell Spin. Stay contesting Stolzi in so much trouble. Can't find the fire spit follow up and is being supported by Saris with Restore Soul, but so close to conversion. The two frontliners, the Cryptic still alive. The Dredge Anchor right at the over the top. Fred the Needle pulls in Stolzi. Doze up on a 12 streak right now, proving that they can play every champion that comes their way. Body on Ruckus contesting, but how long will it last? Doze ups continues to hit these dredge anchors, pulling everybody in danger. Z1 drops the eye drop bodies most appropriately. Ash is trying to commit, but what else is there to keep alive? Doze ups with another clutch dredge anchor will help his team get that 2 0 advantage as the payload crosses the finish line. My goodness, Doze ups. And look at that as well. We saw just before the screen shifted, Dozops running the Kronos on Makoa, something we're seeing time and time again. Doesn't care so much for the anti-heal application because this team of Team Cryptic, now with a Makoa Master on their squad, is really playing around the dredge anchor. It doesn't matter who you pull, even if you don't have Cauterize yourself, the anti-heal will be applied by a teammate. They're focusing on capitalizing Point on this big, important displacement seconds. ability and having that up as much as possible is just letting Do do that thing. Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly what you want to do. He starts feeling himself, and the smoky voice Five, starts to get a little four, more amped up and excited. He's three, on a 15 streak. Are you two, kidding me? I mean, that's Roger. absolutely massive for someone who's been in the front line the entire time. And getting his ultimate charged up that much quicker because he doesn't die, that Ancient Rage survivability box is so clutch when it comes to contesting a point more in that last instance. Whoa, over the top of the Siege Wall with that pull as well onto Ash. Now, I do like the angle that Denial took initial here, straight to the objective, trying to gain some initial capture because they had combat mechanic and now putting the way around the outside of the fight. But down goes the Dread Surf, and that'll buy some time and some space for Team Cryptic. A straight to the back line, Z1 Unknown retreats, waiting for Dozov to try and go for a Dread Anchor. Misses it, and this provides. Z1 unknown, the little bit of a buffer room here. Can dodge roll back in, but doesn't find the cooldown reset. Is a danger of being fragged out by Hydro Bodies. He wisely retreats as the rest of the team and rolls in. Z1 unknown done. goes straight into danger. Dozox is waiting. This is really good play. I mean, trying to contest is the Androx on the Cassie. This is, this is not going the way. Triple kill for Dozox. Can he be stopped? He's got 18 onto his name so far in this kill streak and potential for more as he's up to 66%. And the rest of his team is just absolutely happy to kill whoever he pulls in, but not even necessary as he's able to find three there. 9 0 9 18 streaks with Ancient Rage available. As soon as a player is in front of them, that dredge anchor is magnetic. I mean, obviously onto Ruckus, potentially, as they are made of metal. Onto Ash as well, just keeping the frontline CC down, getting the shutdown kills where they need to. So low on the objective, Ash in battering around. Shoulder Bash will be trying to contest. As soon as those up goes low, out comes Ancient Rage. The anchor is swinging. Target focus swaps to Ceres to try and keep the support locked down. And now to Cassie as well, finds the the pull again and again, just looking for the frags. Without Cauterize, has a great deal of trouble at shutting him down. But meanwhile, the rest of his team is getting the kills on the flanks. I drop bodies with a second. Evil Eye finding one as well. Bitey's trying to stay alive. Overtime in effect, but it's going to go 3 0 at this point in time as Cryptic continues to dominate thanks to, again, that big anchor of Makoa played by Dosa, who's continuing to find kills. He's top damage. Are you kidding me? He's not even running Clock Makoa. Dosa is running Half Shell Makoa. There is no bonus damage following their dredge anchor. They're just hitting all of their shots. Accuracy. 
to the max. Stolzy comes in looking for somebody here, but forced to run away as I drop Bonnies has their number. Continues round the backside of the fight, gets the slay onto a rise, as well as Dread Serpent coming out in tandem to that. Double kill as they pluck Bidey from the air. Can they find the triple on a Stolzy? No. The dragon will retreat, and Wi-Fi must also run tail between their legs. Body blocks in so much danger here. Team Cryptic is on a rampage, just rolling through their opponents. Can they be stopped? They need to get Z1 going here, because Cassie has been very minimal as far as the impact she's brought to the table thus far, and that's not what you need. It's allowing Eyedrop Bodies to continue to win that 1v1 and find more. He's done a very good job, and of course, all the displacement coming out of these Dreadjackers, again, finding on the Bitey there, as the rest of the team, Kuskidi, able to help get everyone sustained. Wardoom is also pushing forward in this traditional way, and looking for more kills as they continue to move forward, but now he goes to still overextended. The rest of his team is forced to play a little bit of catch-up as the payload stalls out. With a streak like that, Dragon Punch straight to 100% denial. Do you have an ultimate with which to defend if necessary? Stolzy finds Wardoom as well, looking for another one on the Cus Cutie. Will the Noob talk about it? Well, Stolzy CC! Cus Cutie gets the slay onto the Lord of the Skies themselves. And I drop bodies continue to put pressure onto the enemy backline. Forcing their way onto Ceres, reversal is charged, but Z1 alone, alas, comes online, finds a double kill shutdown, and that might be all the denial needed to start gaining some momentum, but 45 seconds still remain. And Evil Eye found himself a double ward him, finding a third in this exchange, is actually going to continue to keep numbers in favor of Team Cryptic, pulling back this major comeback, being down two maps. They have nothing but momentum on their side, up 3-0, 30 seconds until overtime, looking for a kill into Bitey, but he will just narrowly escape with his life. Oh, just kidding, he didn't get any heals, what happened? Just out of combat, didn't uh, reach the regeneration timer in enough time, and I drop bodies. Well, drop the body, exactly as they need to. Shut down as well, Evil Eye finds Z1 unknown, perfect place, probably one finds a stun, shut down. Stolzy in trouble, looking for damage, just poking around with fire spit, but Dread Serpent comes out to zone, gets caught in it as well. Even with the healing from Ceres, will it be enough? Convergence comes down, pulls in those ups. Arai gets at least one shutdown, but this could be it, and it will be. The payload pushes through. Team Cryptic, they've taken it all. I could not say enough how dangerous it is to let Cryptic get back on their momentum train and what it means and how devastating it is. You see Kuski flicks the bandana into the crowd, is so amped up about this, and rightfully so. A hard-fought victory, but I think if you just look at the last three maps, that's the Cryptic we've come to know and the one we should expect from here on out. Absolutely. They really found their footing towards the end of that set, and when they got the momentum going, when they had... But they felt warmed up at that point, and they made the swaps which are necessary. They put bodies onto the fraggers, they let them do their thing, put people where they do feel comfortable rather than forcing some of the maybe strange pickups. Finding victory, a reverse sweep, and you can see the handshakes coming through. Well, we always knew that at least one North yeah. American team would be making it to the semifinals, but Team Cryptic, well deserved. Yeah, you gotta give a lot of props to Denial, though, at the same point, to come out swinging like they did and take two maps. Very impressive. I mean, they're super impressive, but it comes down to who can adapt. We talked about this, what land means, who can adapt best. One switch, put Mordem on Inara, put bodies on the Makoa, and then eventually get him onto an Androxus. I, I mean, just really smart play calling and just understanding of what your team is doing well and not doing well. Cryptic, again, the last, we'll say two and a half maps. That is the Cryptic that everyone should be afraid of. And who we expected to show up from the beginning. It took them a little bit longer than I think they wanted to to get online, but the fact of the matter is they're here and they're ready to play. They didn't just get online, they got on LAN champions and we are ready with somebody if i'm not mistaken evan on the stage with a member of team cryptic the team did just clutch victory in game five of this quarterfinal set advancing through to face gang stars tomorrow in the semi-finals evan let's take it away Whoa, what an exciting game for all of us. Of course, just coming down from that best of five game that went the distance. You guys end up taking the cake. Dosip's captain of this team. How does it feel? Feels amazing, it really does. That was one of the hardest series we've ever played. You know, we scrim them all the time. We play them in tournaments all the time. I've never been even close to that kind of intensity. It was amazing. I mean, I mean, one of the things that's so impressive to me is you guys came back from a very uh, destitute position, so to say. There was no hope on your faces, and it was almost like a disbelief. But they had a bit of a disbelief, too. It was like Stolze couldn't believe he won that second game. How much of your guys' confidence going into this set helped to carry you through to becoming the victor eventually? We are a very momentum-based team. Uh, we knew going into this that we're going to defeat ourselves a lot of the time if we don't keep it in check. 
It's been a problem, so we talked about it. We knew if we're going down, we need to keep the confidence up. It doesn't matter, you know. I told we took a uh, like 10 seconds, take a few deep breaths, everyone recollect themselves, and uh, you know we we picked up an Anjo. You take Z1, try to put him in a box a little bit because he was just crushing in the first two games. You know, for me, obviously you're you're taking over the captain role after not being the captain for. I'm just kidding. Dosips was always the captain, and so for some reason we just call Cus Cutie the captain. Um, you showed up big in that last game. Yeah. I think that was what was most exciting to see. What was going through your mind as you, you went on to Serpent Beach with that half-shell Makoa? Going through my mind was just screaming hooks. I'm about to hook, follow it up. Just screaming. Yeah, you, I'm sure everyone could hear us. We're very loud. It was, it was all momentum. It was momentum. I mean, a triple kill, I'm sitting there with, uh, with high-risk pretty hair inside the crown saying, top damage on not even a pluck Makoa, a half-shell Makoa? That is stupidly hard to do. Yeah. I mean, you're tuning it up. You said right now that the tournament has started. started. This is a great warm-up for Gangstars. Yeah, absolutely. I can't wait. This is only round one. We have a, many tough matches coming up. Uh, I'm sure half-shell Makoa is going to be here again, you know. I uh, enjoy it a lot. Just uh, one last question as we do look towards the future. You will be facing against Gangstars, a team that's obviously gotten to the finals every major land. Uh, you guys have yet to get past that semi semifinalist. Is today, is this tournament tomorrow, I guess, the time? Absolutely. We got the confidence, we have the mentality, visualizing the win. It showed here. You know, we had to ramp up a little bit, kind of a slow start, but we're here now and we're here to win. Congratulations, best of five, reverse sweep. Team Cryptic, Captain Dosip's here. Give him a hand in the crowd. So we are gonna be getting into some more Paladins action, but before we do, we've got an exciting reveal of a new locale you might be able to play on in your games. Let's take a look at the next sneak peek for the new map in Paladins.